Support for this week's episode of The Zillion Test comes from Squarespace. Whether you need a portfolio to showcase your work, a store to sell your products and services, or a blog to share your ideas, Squarespace gives you everything you need to make your next move into a reality. Not to mention with Squarespace's beautifully designed templates and customizable features, creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. Simply add and arrange your content with a click of a mouse, no coding required ever. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and use the offer code TEST, T-E-S-T, to get 10% off your first purchase. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, August 10th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode. I'm Norm. We're going to jump right into it, introducing our co-host this week. It's Jeremy Williams. Hello, hello. And Kishore Hari, playing Hel- out some action figures. Hello. That's right, action figures. Action figures. Collectibles. Uh, so how, are, how are you guys doing? Doing well. I'm doing well. Summer's winding down. I'm feeling that... It's get, it's time to get back to work. Last ditch vacation. It's time to build up hype for fall hardware. That eclipse for, is coming pretty soon. Yeah, less than two weeks to the eclipse. I guess by uh-huh. the time people listen to this, we're only ten days away. Oh my god! You uh, guys do anything for the eclipse? Going to going to Oregon, perhaps? It's first day of school. Yeah, same here. So I'm walking my kid to school. Uh, I actually, the, this is a little controversial in science circles. I don't get what the big deal is. Wait, wait, what? The Eclipse or walking your kid to school? Uh, no, I think walking the kid to school is a big deal. Okay. I don't think it's the Eclipse proven. That is that big of a deal. Why? And, like, people always talk about, like, having this spiritual experience when you're in, like, the, the totality. Because the stars come out in the sky in the middle of the day. And I think you don't have to physically be there you know, to have a similar experience. It's, people don't like this <clears throat> opinion at all. This is the kind of thing that people get on special flights to see, right? I mean, this yeah. is the, something people spend money to travel and experience. I don't get that. But if it's happening above my head... Oh, I'm going to look up. It's all good. They get on special flights to see it from the sky. Yeah. And, and track yeah. it. They, they yeah. get a longer... Right. Eclipse, but I'm not thrilled with the idea of sort of going going to like Oregon or Wyoming and braving like the the you know millions of people that will be there for an experience that lasts a few minutes. Yeah, I'm with you. That's right, cynics. You sign cynics. Unite. Wedding planning. <laughs> Go to a wedding. <laughs> um, wow. Well, okay. I guess we'll know where you guys will be on August 21st. Yeah, we're going to school. You're going to walk your kids to school. <laughs> what um, about you? Are you going to watch the eclipse? N- probably not. I don't have plans to go to Oregon, but maybe doing something else that that weekend. It's the week of my birthday. I got to be doing something. You can see it here, right? It, it's I think somewhere Partial. around seventy percent. That's pretty yeah. good. Of yeah. totality. I'll take yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it does need to be. I'm not a completionist. <laughs> but that last thirty <laughs> percent. That's the part of the sun I do like. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, no big travel plans. Uh, you guys do anything fun over the weekend? I went to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. <laughs> In the warm California sun. Warm California sun. <laughs> Boardwalk. <laughs> what are you doing? Did you bring your Pepsi can to get $10 off admission? Is that a thing? That is totally a thing. We just wow. pointed the commercial. It's, it's been a commercial that's been running since I was a child. It's the same song. The boardwalk is never as fun as that commercial ever makes it to be or as packed. <laughs> now, for those that don't know, it's it's basically just like it's the the beach boardwalk and it has a bunch of sort of chintzy rides like little roller coasters mm-hmm. and like spinning arcades different things and, and old school arcades. It it starts out as a good idea, but it always ends a little bit sad because, you know, it's like carnival type food, like state yeah, totally. fair. Everything fried, that kind of stuff. Well, Santa Cruz is a beautiful place. Yeah. And there's so much to do there uh, in town. People go surfing. There's a lot of great food there. The boardwalk's like the novel, terse thing to do. But they keep on advertising it to the Bay Area, to, to locals. Well, I took I took my son for a couple hours. And like we ended up um, starting with like, like just going on a couple rides and stuff. And then 
he was basically done with the rides and all he did was play <laughs> in the arcade for a while. Oh. And it would make it would warm Jeremy's heart to know that he didn't want to play any of the fancy games, even though I was trying to get that money off that card so we could leave. <laughs> he wanted to play pinball. And he was like, wow. 50 cent pinball. That's my my style. And you're like, why not pay $2 for this fancy version of Pac-Man that you can play or Space Invaders? Play this weird pod racing game that costs $5 for some reason. Or yeah, you could yeah. just lie and say the card is out of money. Nope. All he wanted to do was play Star Trek pinball. Good for him. Little, <laughs> little scientist. He's interested in physics. Have you seen the that uh, wall size Space Invaders? That's in some arcades now. I've seen the biggest Pac-Man machine ever, which I think also plays Galaga. Is that what you mean? No, Where it's like a vertical LED screen. It's an LED screen. Maybe that's it is the same thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's like it's a LED lights. They're kind of space far apart. A lot of a lot of black space. Yeah. But um, you the when you for Space Invaders, it's two players, and it's you hold like a, a toy gun and you aim. And there's a lot of visual effects. I think it's hmm. worth Googling. Hmm. Um, see if I can find a video of it. Space Invaders. Um, it's I, We saw it in um, in England when we were there at Arcade. And I saw it recently. It's at Tanfran. So um, it's one of those like big novelty arcade machines that's now making the rounds. We, we played in Angry Birds like that that had a physical gun that you would shoot um, well, whatever, like a bird at a screen. And where it hit the screen is where it would start doing its like effects they got to do interesting things i mean like san francisco rush is not going to cut it anymore <laughs> you know the, the boardwalks used to be littered throughout the california coast like the santa cruz is one of the last ones remaining that's what I, that's what i like mm-hmm. going about go, that's what i like going about going there uh, there used to be one here in san francisco called playland oh playland at the beach at the beach no. that playland was like a hundred years ago no, well, um, no it was like close in the 70s i think mm. it was yeah it was not doing well then right right and it had your nickels uh nickelodeon slots the, your little animatronic toys obscura cameras were there that's right there there is still by the beach there is a camera obscura a giant camera obscura but now it's all in museums and well playland not at the beach now exists where they restored a lot of those games yeah i let i feel the nostalgia of those places but as an adult, when you're there, you're like, oh, these these are not nearly as fun as when I was eight. Your game is Space Invaders Frenzy. That's it's right. $13,000. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. You could make that for less than $13,000. Let's maybe. do it. Let's do it. That, that would be a nice Bits to Adams episode. But it is, That's a it's high a, budget it's Bits a, to Adams yeah, episode. Yeah, we're not going to pay $13,000 <laughs> for that. It's, it's a giant a, a matrix of LEDs, but it's interactive. You're, you're not just holding a joystick. You're actually aiming at parts of it and the animations are if you watch a video of it the animations are fantastic i think yeah it's by raw thrills the same guys that did the uh, pac-man ah okay there you go space invaders frenzy if you got thirteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars to spare an arcade you can make it back a dollar fifty at a time that's uh eugene jarvis's company he did robotron oh. and defender Okay, well, I'm glad it's nice. a good pedigree. For real. Um, this past weekend, I had some uh, a little bit of sadness. Uh, I may be looking to get a new car. What happened? Oh, this is like... So we know that... We're, we're not jumping ahead too far, but we know that the Tesla 3 is coming out. We talked about it last week. Um, pricing's been announced, and I got my deposit in. I'm looking forward to maybe sometime before the end of next year buying, uh, buying a Model 3, you know, saving up for that. And my car is the current car, 10 years old. Uh, 105,000 miles, you know, it still has a couple years left in it, or maybe not. Uh, I had some water <laughs> leakage, and I thought it was a, a gasket or something, but it turns out, long story short, they found that it's uh, the AC exhaust, what's, what's plugged. And so, uh, you know, like air conditioning, you need mm-hmm. to... The, 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 yeah, because it hasn't water. been raining here, so... No, exactly. I live in the foggy part of the town, so I thought it was like overnight mildew or something. Uh, but it, I was getting an inch of water in the back seat. Oh, no. And so the the shop said it's going to be like $5,000 to, to fix it and replace it because of potential electrical wiring damage, the harnesses. So $5, the car's not even worth that much. So I don't even know damn. if it's worth it. So it might be pushed to buying an interim car, leasing a car, which got me diving down. And I think it's a really bad time right now to buy a car. Why? A new car. A new car. You mean bad time of the year? Bad time in, in no in in the uh, in the transition from uh, gas cars to hybrids <coughs> to electrics. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because if you're gonna look to buy a new car, not everyone, <coughs> new cars not for everyone. Used car are totally great. Uh, but if you're gonna be looking to buy a new car to last you ten years, like the features you want 
in that car 10 years from now, uh, some type of autopilot capability, which many car manufacturers have promised and they're in the cars in the next two years, um, you know, gas efficiency or going all electric, your options are very limited and they're very expensive. I, I think that's optimistic. I think the next year is going to be the bad time to buy the car because I, I think we're still really far away like, from where, where oh, it's, you it, are you're expecting saying it's not, to be. It's not even bad yet. Yeah, I don't think we've <laughs> even reached that point where it's bad. I think we're still two years away from you being able to walk into a dealership and walk out with a Model 3. Now, I don't think it, it's going to be the case that in five years, all gas cars are going to be obsolete. <laughs> but in 10 years, in five to 10 mm-hmm. years, I'm going to feel real bad about having a car that has 20 to 25 you know, uh, miles per gallon mileage. I don't think gas is going away. Hybrids are going to be there to stay. But you know, even looking at the Prius, those are expensive right now. Like a, a nice Prius is... And if you want 50 miles per gallon, you got to pay $30,000, $35,000. Damn. I know. Well, this would be a fun adventure, Norm. Yeah, I got I to I deep, think deep. <laughs> I got to put aside my desires to own a pinball machine and, and just, Get a boosted and just board. deal with it. <laughs> I don't think I can commute to L.A. on a boosted board. Not to L.A. No. <laughs> I couldn't commute to L.A. on a, on a Chevy, uh, Chevy Bolt. No, or a Model 3. Or a Model 3. Not in one drive, at least. Supercharge None. it in Kettleman City on the way. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you still haven't done that yet, Jeremy, right? Uh, have I done, like, a long road a trip? long road trip. No, just up to wine country and back. So I've done the... I've done probably 150 miles. You, have you done a trip where you had to, for the sake of the road trip, never charged outside? Charge no. 30 minutes to never. get that. Yeah. See, Not I, even I, for the parking spot? Uh, I have done that, but only where it's free. So, oh. like, Muir Woods and Target. <laughs> that's pretty but much. But not as part it. of a road trip. Not as part Just of a road part trip. Of the topping off part of the. That's the, too the, scary. Like, wait, why? You, you have you no guarantee. You have no guarantee that that hey, spot will be there. Don't for you. hate on a Muir Woods Target road trip. I did that three weeks ago. Same exact thing. I literally I went to a Muir Woods and stopped at a Target on the But you didn't charge an electric car. I did not. I would love to hear your experience driving down to L.A. knowing that you had to charge yeah. at the Harris Ranch. And and wait for thirty minutes to an hour to top off to get enough to go over the grapevine. That's terrifying. All right, let's go to the pop culture news. Uh, we're actually recording this episode on early in the week um, from when we normally do. We're doing this on a Tuesday, but surprisingly, a lot of news has already come out. Uh, top of the list for pop culture, we have our very first images of Thanos. Thanos become Cable. Looks good. I mean, Josh this, Brolin. This is the first. Uh, this is the second set of pictures we've gotten out from the te- Deadpool movie. We got one last week. Yes, was of it? Domino. Of yeah, Domino laying in front of the fireplace in a very traditional Deadpool pose on top of a Deadpool bearskin rug. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that that one Domino looks great. Domino is going to be a really fun character. But people have been waiting for Cable because Cable uh, is the foil. The, to Deadpool in the comics, they have the the buddy cop relationship, the superhero version of the buddy cop relationship. Um, <coughs> Cable's super serious, and there was a lot of build up to the casting of Cable. A lot of people had wanted Michael Shannon, perhaps, to be cast as Cable. Michael Shannon from Boardwalk Empire, from uh, Superman. I, I mean, was rooting for Jeremy. He kind of has a Cable look to well, him. Yeah, just because he, he has a little bit of the. the I appreciate that, man. <laughs> you have like the right hair coloring for Cable. <laughs> you just need to put on a couple hundred pounds of of muscle and just be angry at the world. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes. those a sinister, or, uh, a cynical time traveler. I have the anger part down. It's just suppressed. So, uh, Jeremy, what do you know about Cable? Uh, as what I just learned in the last two minutes. Ah, uh, uh, let's give you a little more. Cable was uh, in the X Men comics, a time traveler from an alternate future where he was the son of Cyclops. And Jean Grey. The X-Men? The X-Men. Scott Summers' son is Cable, whose name is... Um, huh. Is it an acronym? No, 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 no. It's... Uh, <clears throat> oh, gosh. It's something Summers. Um, so he has a mutant power? He does have a mutant power, but his uh, defining characteristics... This is created by Rob Liefeld. Uh, you never see his feet. Uh, but he has a cybernetic arm. 
because Rob Liefeld, the artist, never knew how to draw feet. Huh. Um, uh, cybernetic arm, one eye is a electronic eye, and he has scars over the, those, his other eye. Those aren't mutant powers. Well, that, that's just physical characteristics oh, for, yeah. for how visually mm-hmm. how it appeared. What were his mutant powers? Uh, well, well, first of all, his name's Nathan Summers. Nathan Summers, that's right. And he's not technically the son of of Cyclops and Jean Grey. It's Cyclops and a clone of Jean Grey. Okay, it's it's Madeline uh, Pryor. Is it? Yeah, Madeline Pryor. And I, I don't know. He has that weird energy ability where he can like charge up things, like kind of a la Gambit. God, we're gonna get killed. Did in Cyclops the, know in the he, comments? He was getting it on with a clone of Jean Grey. She I was an evil remember. clone. It was an alternate. Yeah. version of the future so his <laughs> powers are telepathic and telekinetic um it, but he really just holds big guns he has big guns and big shoulder <laughs> yeah. pads uh the photo of josh brolin as cable now we got a little bit of a sneak preview of this because josh brolin's big public appearance in pop culture previous to this was at d23 where he revealed the thanos uh the family right the at the the marvel booth so um, we already saw him with that haircut, this cable haircut, his mm. short hair, him looking very, very fit. Uh, and the photo, the two photos they released of cable look fantastic. They, they do look really good. very cap- scarred up. Cap- up. The cy- like kind of cybernetic eye kind of component. Yeah, is that's there. cool. Do you think that that's after effects, or do you think that that's a, a live effect? That's gotta be after. That's gotta be uh, Photoshop. That'd be cool. Though. Yeah, yeah. figure that out. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that even a prompt publicity photo, because it, it needs post-production work. It needs <laughs> yeah. some type of photoshopping, doctoring in the, the I mean, I mean the, the makeup is going to be real, like the scars over his eyes. Yeah. Even the cyber arm, there are parts of it where it looked like, you know, they did some post-work. Because for the film, he's probably just wearing like, you know, a, a green screen glove with some tracking markers, right? He might have given him a real glove, a real gun. He needs that weight. He's got to feel it. No, he's got super strength. Oh, it just needs it? to have the sound. The sound just needs to be there. It just needs to sound like it's huh. mechanical. Hmm. Um, it's a different cybernetic arm than Bucky's cybernetic arm. So not to get people confused. I know it's like gonna be a year of cybernetic arms, but the the costume looks great. Looks like he's like a some guerrilla war fighter uh, from the future. He has like ammo strapped all over him. He's wearing a t-shirt, um, but uh, the gun looks sufficiently big. Uh, it's it's pretty are neat. You, are you excited about Deadpool too? After this photo, yes. Really? So I'm actually not. I think that's the beauty of Deadpool 1 is it sort of caught me by surprise. I had no expectations for it. Ryan Reynolds and superhero movies haven't exactly gone great in the past. Uh, what, and now, what else did he do? Green, Green Lantern. Lantern. Oh, There's a whole list of actors who've done two plus, more than one comic slash superhero roles. Uh, for example. Batfleck. Uh, Batman, uh, yes, Ben Affleck as Ma- Batman and Michael Daredevil. Keaton. Michael Keaton as the Vulture and Batman and Birdman. Jeez. Uh, Birdman's not a comic book hero. It's a kind of a comic book hero. <laughs> uh, Chris Evans as both Human Torch and uh, Captain America. Uh, who else? Just, just, the list goes on and on. Uh, Michael B. Johnson as as both uh, in the Black Panther movie and also the Human Torch again. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with being in two studios. Uh, you know, Josh Brolin, of course, and as Cable and as mm, Thanos. Uh, Thanos and Jonah Hex. He's he's a he's a triple Forgot about triple Jonah movie, Hex. movie actor. Um, but that's because Marvel is you know Marvel Studios. They they can hire whoever they want. And a lot of the Marvel characters belong to other studios, have the rights to do. That's why Mark Ruffalo said there may never be a standalone Hulk film because the Hulk, uh, standalone Hulk film rights still belong to Universal. And uh, and they can only, oh, Hulk can only be a part of a team in the Marvel Studios canon. Can I ask you something about the Hulk real quick? Sure. In the, the new Thor trailer at the very end, they showed that, that funny little thing where they're having a little banter back yeah. and forth. And Hulk looks like Mark Ruffalo more than I think he has before. Is that true? Yes. Okay. And just that's, mo- I, I think that's in, it's just styles of change. It's like they change the costuming of the heroes. Okay. I don't think it tells the evolutionary story, perhaps. Maybe it does because he does speak more in yeah. this film. And how is that possible? How is it that Hulk can sit down and have a conversation now? Right. He was learning to control his rage. Just like you oh. push it down, yeah. the Hulk learned to push it down. I don't think the Hulk should be able to push it down. So Why in the not? comics, in the comics, the Hulk at some point had the intelligence of Banner and the strength of Hulk, uh, the full intelligence. Talk like a totally. It wasn't just Hulk smash, Hulk smash. Really? Yeah, um, totally. So I guess the question is for this telling of the Hulk, 
is it a case, and it would be interesting if they found a case to make it like give Hulk more control, give Banner more control of Hulk, but the trade off is he's less powerful. Oh. Or heals less quickly. Yeah. Or it, the, the rage, the out of control, the, the decrease in cognition gives him his strength. It's, it's like tied a, that way. Like an RPG, he's adjusting his levels. He's adjusting his levels. Yeah. Yeah. And more banner, slide the banner level all the way up, <laughs> right. and the strength goes down. Or maybe it's a, it's a weird curve. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, but speaking of other studios, so Fox is the one that does Deadpool, and they have the rights to all the X Men, uh, both for TV and for the movies. But they also have the rights to the Fantastic Four. And Fantastic Four has been, versions of the Fantastic Four have been on screen at least three times now from the Roger Corman films to um, the, the Tim Story films to the, uh, the most recent ones, uh, the last one with uh, Michael B. Johnson and, and Kate Mara. Um, Director unnamed because it was such an abomination. Such, the director of Chronicle, uh, who was going to do another Star Wars film. Anyway, uh, Marvel seems is unhappy with the fa- what Fox has done with one of its flagship characters. The the Fantastic Four are a crown jewel of of Marvel. Used to be. It used to be. I mean, very storied history and, and still beloved. The characters are beloved. They're the first family of the Marvel comics, right? And uh, what has come out now is the it may the Marvel's disappointment in the Fantastic Four films may have bled into the, the comics, and they have recently uh, canceled the comic book series because of the rights of the films because they could not. Because they could not reclaim this is a pure rumor, but uh, the the writer of the recent Fantastic Four comics says that they Marvel decided to cancel Fantastic Four comics because uh, they couldn't get the rights back from Fox. One, this feels petty. It totally is. Two, I don't totally buy it. I actually would would garner that the sales of the series is also probably not great. That probably has some relation to the films being terrible. So uh, I would. I would disagree because the writer is Jonathan Hickman. He's a fantastic writer. Yeah. And I think that there's a misconception. There's a there's an audience misconception that the films drive interest in the comics and the comics drive interest in the films. I think they're in, there's crossover for sure in the Venn diagram of audiences. But I think the, the comics can be fantastic and be well-received and be sustainable without having any affiliation with the film. The Fantastic Four comics have been wonderful in the Ultimates universe and the 616 universe, what Jonathan Hickman did with um, the the um, the FF um, when he renamed it, um, mm. and uh, the Future Foundation, and like I, I think comics fans are looking for something different in the comics than they are necessarily from the films. And the films are looking for visual spectacle; they're looking for um, great acting, great special effects. Um, in the comics, they're looking for like canon history story and um and, and, and maybe a different flavor hmm. uh but the point is that it sucks that business on one ha- one hand of the business will affect the other hand of the business and it comes to the detriment of the fans and a lot of it's because of rights negotiations and the expectations that these these franchises have to bring a certain amount of money into the business which has never been an expectation for comics pre-2007 pre-Iron Man. So, I've never been a Fantastic Four fan. If we're going to lose a group... No! This is the group to lose. Goody two-shoes group. They're not my... They're not as big to me as Thanos, but they are. They're up there. I love the Fantastic Four. Um, One last bit of comic news, and this may be a reconciliation in terms of creator-owned uh, rights and, and, and a perfect merge of uh, film and TV production and... And uh, and comic in comic form is that the Miller World brand of comics. This is Mark Miller. He's a a writer who had written previously for uh, DC and for Marvel. He was one that you could credit to say to bring the version of the Avengers as we know as they appear on film. Uh, he has been doing his independent create creator created comics for a long time. Um, some have been more controversial than others. There have been most of them have been miniseries runs. Uh, but his company was just bought by Netflix. Yeah, for those that don't know this work, um Kick Ass um is probably the most famous piece. Kingsman is Kingsman, I, yes. I didn't know that. Kingsman was a comic series written by Mark Muller and then adapted by Fox. Um I want to say Kick Ass was 
not Fox, Lionsgate, um, and they they bought that adaptation. He's had many of his comic series option because they were creator owned. He had more control and he could sell them. Uh, but so he, he wasn't a production house. Miller World was a comic book company, a right? Comic book okay. company, exactly. And he worked with a lot of great artists that were very famous in the uh, comic book world. People who weren't just signed to one publisher or another. Uh, so he's done. Um, he's done a lot of his. A lot of his comic themes are just like twists on. They're also a little traditional, and they're they're very dark. There's one called Nemesis, which is the whole premise is what if Batman was the evil? Like, what if someone with the intellect and the resources of Batman was just pure evil, and how would he be like the Joker version of Batman? Uh, there's one called Superior, which is a very uh, interesting take on Shazam. Um, it's what if uh, a kid was given the powers to be. Uh, turn into the body of a superhero, but how would they psychologically reconcile with that? Uh, but the point is that Netflix is going to take these properties and presumably turn them in, either into films on Netflix or TV shows, Are which they I'm very excited by. Do you think they're trying to build a universe or just a bunch of little mini serial? I think mini mini series things. Yeah, hmm. I don't think they're trying to build a shared Miller World universe. Um, but uh, but I, I think. It's, it, I don't know how much, they haven't said how much this was for, but in terms of Disney buying Marvel or Warner Brothers buying DC all those years ago, um, this, is, this is a big deal. I mean, Netflix has a lot of money, and if they're going to spend, the, they're going to still publish the comics, like Mark Miller's going to work for them and be a creative arm for them, uh, but now there's this whole pathway for the, that IP to be turned into TV series, um, and it could, it could get, you know, Netflix has done well by Marvel with the Daredevil and Jessica Jones and the Defenders, but that's not going to go on forever. And um, now they have their own characters to to foster. Mm -hmm. We have a few quick hitters now um, in, in pop culture. Have you seen the new Lego Ideas stuff? Uh, yeah. So Lego Ideas... Uh, if, if you just browse the Lego Ideas website, there's such, some such great designs out there. Are these the user submitted ideas? These are all user submitted. They all need about 10,000 votes. Um, and a voting means it's got to create a Lego Ideas account and say, and fill out a very short survey of like, how many sets would you buy? Who, but what, what age is this? Do you think this design would be great for? Would you buy it? Yes or no? And if you get 10,000 of those votes, that commitment of people saying that they would be interested, then it goes through a formal approval process. And they do it seasonally. And I think every quarter they announce, you know, these nine sets that have 10,000 votes are being moved to next level of consideration. And then they'll pick one or two to be made. And the two that were announced from the most recent qu quarter, one is a ship in a bottle. I really Which, like that I one. I really like it as well. Now, when you said that to me, I said, there's no way they did a transparent bottle in Lego. It's and I got, said, yeah, there are plenty of transparent, purely transparent Lego pieces. I, I would have thought it'd be too opaque. There's too many parts inside. It would, you wouldn't be able to see through, but they found the parts. They, they found the parts. It's like the, the windshield of cars. Think of like building a small Lego spaceship and the windshield. Like those pieces put yeah. together is the ship in the bottle. The only disappointment I would have is that you're not actually putting the Lego pieces together through the neck of the bottle and then like pulling a string to then, raise it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we're using tweezers yeah. now i guess I, there's nothing stopping someone from doing yeah that. exactly maybe that's you could do it however you want we could build the lego bottle first mm -hmm. and then put the ship together inside that'd be fun um but the other one is voltron yes and they actually form voltron so it is the no way. It's how many uh, characters? How many? How many? Five, five, five lions. Lions in a Voltron, are individual Lego sets, or no? It's one set, but individual Lego builds. Yep. And then they actually transform and connect together. Now the uh, the designers that submitted this design will work with Lego official designers to to actually prototype and come up with something that can be, can be made and doesn't use any legal connecting pieces, like legal in terms uh. of how, how Lego pieces are supposed to be put together according to the, their guidelines. Uh, so it may not look like the submission, but the concept is there. They've said that they want to make it so the five lines can be built separately and can be attached together and form Voltron. And I'm it, surprised they got yeah, the rights. It is classic Voltron with the with the lions. It's not the new Netflix show. Voltron. Well, right. Yeah. It's classic logo. Classic Voltron. And there was a second Voltron back in the day that was Cars. I don't know if you even know, remember that. But yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it looks good. It's just what you want. 
Speaking of, have you been watching the Voltron? They released season three. Yeah, out of nowhere. I because I didn't. This was they, not on my radar. They had released a trailer and announced a date a couple months ago. Okay, I, I did see the trailer and then I just missed the release. But yes, we are three episodes into this short season. Yeah, it's a two part season. Seven so episodes. They're gonna in release this one. a second half of the season in a in a couple months. Um, I finished. I like. I totally binged it. Is great. That show is is really good. Every time I watch, and I'm watching it with my son. Every time I watch it, I'm just like, this show. Just even just if you watch it with the sound off, it just looks amazing. And I just I, I have to tell him, you don't know what you've got here. Yeah, especially um, <laughs> no spoilers, but the last episode of the season really did a lot of world and history building oh, cool. in a, a fantastic way. It filled in the blanks, but still left this great cliffhanger. And if you watched it in the '80s. That cartoon was awful, hmm. like like a special kind of awful. And it's on Netflix, the original one. Yeah. Uh, so and, it's how and, you remember the cartoon, how you wanted to think of it in your head, except manifests to reality, yeah, to quality. And, yeah, except this is like darker and but still goofy, and um, there's actually like a larger story in play that the original didn't really have. I just love that they've embraced this this style of animation, which is almost minimal in the amount of frames that you get you mm -hmm. know per second but it's like they just put it all in the detail and then mm -hmm. you'll get these smooth animations where these ships are flying and it's not like a looping thing it's like every frame is unique i think it's gorgeous uh, a couple last things uh we're going to talk about star trek for just a second um you're still watching TNG with your son, is that right? Uh, on occasion. Okay. Yeah, we, I think we're taking a break at the moment. Oh. Why? Why do you ask? Well, I don't know if we plan on watching uh, Deep Space Nine or Star Trek Voyager. No. It's going to be uh, a lot to ask him to get to yeah, Voyager. Yeah, it's true. And this past weekend was the Star Trek convention in, in, in Vegas, the big annual Star Trek Las Vegas convention. Did you see that they... Um, the Anovos and Creation Entertainment had released headphones that earbuds that look like uh, Vulcan ears so you oh. they, like they're like Vulcan ears you you put on your ears like or think of them as hobbit ears whatever pointy elf ears uh, Vulcan ears but the tip of them could turn into earbuds mm -hmm. and the earbuds are hidden in the ears <laughs> even as clever design even at a comic convention I wouldn't wear those what no I, no I can't t testify to the quality of the earbuds but Theoretically, you could take take those and splice in your nice drivers. But it's not the that's sound not quality. The issue. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not. What are you guys talking about? That's not the issue. Oh, that's not the issue. It's the ears. The ears to me are the selling point. <laughs> You're not. That's not daily wear. It's you not. Put well, on my Vulcan ears to like walk around. They're novelty ears. None They're of those perfect for conventions. None of those uh, aftermarket like just throw on ears look any good. They just look chintzy. Like, you got Google Google this because they look these, they these look actually right. look like the, the they're not headphones. They don't cover your ears. I gotcha. They just wrap around the outside of your ears and give you the point. You know what? I did look on ThinkGeek recently, and they have a Bluetooth um, communicator, communicator, which I think is that's pretty cool. How's the speaker on that? Yeah, probably not great, right? Where would they hide the speaker grill? It'd yeah. have to be behind aimed upward because you need to hear it and the microphone yeah yeah it's there's all a lot there. of like directional microphone design you're saying you know? the Vulcaneers sound quality has got to be superior well I don't I don't think it has to be but I think that you can modify it to give you actual yeah. sufficient quality but anyway I digress uh, because uh, there's a video on YouTube uh, a critic that's critiquing the Star Trek Voyager intro sequence the theme sequence yeah, those photos of the ears oh yeah head look shakes terrible. head shakes between Kishore oh, and Jeremy all right that's not for you I'll keep it to myself uh, so in the opening sequence to Voyager um, yeah which I, I'm the only one who could, could sing the song bum uh, bum 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 you're not bum, the only bum, one that can bum, sing the song my wife created custom lyrics to that song right. <laughs> really <laughs> That's yes amazing just still come on and sing them sometimes there's a part of the opening sequence it's all computer generated of course where Voyager is flying over the rings of a planet and uh, it's one of the most beautiful parts of the sequence. I'll play it for you really quickly, Jeremy. But anyone who It's like uh, a Saturn like planet with, right, like, with like a rocky ring. And the camera, virtual camera, pans through the rings, and then you see Voyager flying right above the rings to the point where you even see like the reflection of Voyager on the rings. And I remember as a kid watching that sequence, 
thinking, wow, that's really, really cool. If I yeah. had a spaceship, I would totally want to do that, like skirt the edge of a ring of a planet. And of course, thanks to the internet, that whole sequence has been ruined. What? Because people have calculated that given the known size of the Starship Voyager, given its technical manuals, its, its scale, that planet could not exist with those rings. It would be like smaller than the size of a city, the gravitational force would not be able to hold those rings in place at like in in that configuration. It's physically impossible. Yeah, it, wow, it's a good little video, and it's mostly based on the size of the Voyager ship. Yes, in, con- them, yeah. in conjunction, these with people the should sun. should not watch Voltron because <laughs> they're going to have problems. <laughs> I was trying to apologetics way out of it, like like is it like some visual diffraction Voyager is actually really tiny and it's like an optical illusion that's making it seem really big in that sequence like a lensing effect or some some type of weird gravitational force that Voyager was used and I don't know there's no way for me to explain explain that visual sequence by the way my wife's song is entitled Voyager come join the crew <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so mean cuz you can't <laughs> They're that's the in, that's the point. Yeah. Is it like it really quadrant. it really sets up the whole Although, arc of the show. To be fair, the Voyager crew was the crew that was the most open to other people joining mm. alien species because they needed more crew. There's yeah, yeah, only yeah. a limited number of people. Look at all the meanings you can find in just one lyric of this song. Come join. The Did crew. they take on new members of the crew? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Half the, the whole premise of the show was. That Voyager, an intrepid class science vessel, was chasing a marquee, a maquis uh, ship through the Badlands. The Maquis was uh, the rebel uh, force uh, the Bajorans had to, to fight uh, the Cardassians. And they got sucked into a wormhole uh, that threw them into the Delta Quadrant. And the Maquis crew had to merge with the Voyager crew. Half of the crew on the Voyager ship are these rebels that they had tensions with throughout the entire first two seasons. Chakotay, the second officer in command, was not a Starfleet officer. That's why his pin on his lapel is never Starfleet badges. Never, he never has three pips. It's a Maquis pin. Mm-hmm. Wow, dude. S- spoiler. Yeah. Not really a wormhole. Oh! <laughs> no. no. Don't watch for it season one. <laughs> Was that the show with Seven of Nine? It was a show with Seven yeah. of Nine. So that, they, they brought Borg that, onto the go. ship. There, Neelix. That's one. Neelix, the, the chef. Neelix? Was no. an alien. They found in the Delta Quadrant. Huh. Wow. Oh, you're right. They brought new, new members on. Yes. They all the time. They didn't do that with Next Gen. No. No. Hmm. Next Gen was very insular. It was Federation ship only. This was for survival. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, Game of Thrones. Quickly talk about Game of Thrones. Are uh, you happier now? I am much happier. The last two weeks have made the, you the happier? Last two weeks We're have not been spoiling anything. Fantastic. Anyone who's watched this last week's episode, I know Jeremy isn't cu- quite caught up yet. Uh, you should watch, though, a behind-the-scenes featurette that HBO put out. It's on their YouTube channel. It's a 15-minute feature about the making of one scene in this last episode. Anyone who's seen it knows what I'm talking it, about. It's a, it's a fight scene, and there's just incredible stunt work that happens in it. Um that's hard not to appreciate. I mean, it's this stunt is, pyrotechnics. This isn't much uh, of a spoiler because it, there's just fire involved oh, with the stunt, and you, it's just unbelievable. You can't avoid this talk this week. I was yeah. on uh, just on Twitter, and it just blew up. Everyone's talking about this amazing episode, so it actually got me back into it. So I'm, I'm back try, in Game of Thrones, trying to catch up because I want to watch this amazing episode. Like, yeah. how far behind are you? I'm. Uh, are you like into Ned Stark still? Like, <laughs> like is I'm con- who is it? I'm way <laughs> who behind. Is it still into Ned Stark. I, my goal was initially to watch as much to understand the pinball machine oh, okay <laughs> which put put me up through uh most of season four and so i'm now concluding season four and i gotta move i have two more seasons before i even well, so get the to pinball the pinball machine the storylines only they they cap to when it was released right. which was season four period yeah, yeah, yeah. it is stuck in time it is oh yeah. that's frustrating <laughs> i wonder if they can do a software update to to get the new storylines it's in there. They could, but it wouldn't be worth their money. No, I guess not. Uh, it, it's just a, a uh, there was every epi- every season of the show seems to have one crazy, magnificent battle. Um, for example, uh, where you are watching the show, you maybe have seen the Battle of Blackwater. 
Oh yeah, that, but that was way before. That was way before. Yeah, yeah. But that was the big battle, and they they typically hire, uh, they, I think they hired Neil Marshall to direct that episode. Like big Hollywood directors do hmm. that. Uh, in the previous season, there was a battle called the Battle of Bastards, uh, which was incredible. And it usually isn't like the last episode. It's like the second to last episode or third to last episode. Usually the aftermath episode. Right, right. Uh, and last season there were two of them. Because there was uh, there was that, and there was another one that was a little colder. I, I think we're gonna get it. I think we're gonna get another one coming up in the and next so couple of weeks. This we is, need, we're running well, headlong. In that's the right. Way. Like this this season is only uh, this penultimate season is seven episodes long, and this battle happened four episodes in. So they gotta have. It's not gonna be three episodes of aftermath since we're leading toward the conclusion of the series. So they may there may be another massive battle. But. Indeed. Nobody knows how this ends, right? Because we're ahead of the books. So nobody knows how... No the, fans know how this ends. Yeah, George R. R. Martin, of course, of course. and the, no, the creators so, of the show. But no, you don't know how this, how the Game People, of Thrones no. ends. No, we... we of, of course. No one knows who lives, who dies, who tells their story. We know uh, what's going to happen because we've been fans of fantasy genre forever. So we can just predict what will happen. I see, I see. But uh, people have an, expectations about, like how it comes to a head and if you follow like the the tragedy of the characters and like the logic the the rules of the story writing the show people who make bad decisions typically end up having bad things befall upon them um there's a lot of fair speculation about how it might come to a head okay my favorite prediction of how it comes to an end it will be samuel tarley you like zoom in on him writing the last line of a book entitled A Game of Thrones, and then he shuts the book <laughs> closed, and the series ends. And it zooms out past that astrolabe, and it really is a snow globe. <laughs> and it's in almost fire all over again. I challenge you to hide a Hamilton Easter egg in every podcast. Challenge accepted. All right. I've already done it for this episode. That's right. I know. <laughs> Um, Animatronic one, Lincoln. One last uh, bit of recommendation is another video that you guys should watch. Uh, Garner Holt Productions. They're an animatronics company that's been for decades from been what, yeah, a from supplier. What I understand, they are the animatronics company, right? Like, and we actually we know some people who uh, who work there. Uh, we met them at the RPF party and at various conventions. Everyone who works there is super talented. Uh, they make not only the audio animatronics that you see uh, that you recognize like, from Disney theme parks, but also a lot of the other robots that appear at theme parks as well. They just do fabric amazing fabrication. Uh, stopped by their booth at D23. Connor Holt was there um, to, to show a, a sculpt of their new Lincoln, but this wasn't a... I didn't get to see the actual animatronic. But if you watch the video, there's a new video they put out about their Lincoln. And the animation that this Lincoln has is It's incredible. Uncanny. And it's uncanny both in the Uncanny Valley sense and also in terms of how impressive it is in, in, in animation. I don't think this Lincoln tries to be... Realistic in a sense of like to try to pass Uncanny Valley. It's very clearly exaggerated animation, but I think that's appropriate for Disney. I think they want to show, they they want to wear a little bit of that technology on its sleeve, um, and not try to say, not try to make it look like an actor, but try to make it look like a, a really impressive robot. That's an interesting know. way to look at it. But it's, it's this, really communicating some complex emotions. So the, this animatronic, if you read about it, it has uh, forty five micro servos throughout its entire face. Like it, uh, maybe over, over ten or so, and just in the lips, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually started this technology for the military. Mm. They designed this technology for mannequins that were used in uh, in uh, marine training, so that they could read facial expressions. Wow. You know, among um, crowds, and and try to interpret you know their intentions, and so they, that's how they got started. That's how they did all their research. Now they have this. Uh, this technology that this isn't necessarily for Disney. It's for anybody who wants who wants to buy one for their museum, right, or their home. They say it plugs into a standard outlet. <laughs> <laughs> you too could have a robot face, the, the, and they'll skin or unskin. They will scan your face if you want. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a, a bunch of great YouTube videos out there. Um, Garner Holt, of course, does this. If you look at Legacy Effects, uh, Legacy Effects um, has a great YouTube video that, for a project they did for Siemens, the technology company, mm -hmm. where they made a giant head of an actor and also made it, gave it animatronics. But this was a head where they sliced the back of the head off so, that, so you look inside its its brain. Yeah. And it was for a trade show. But they show you how they made that whole head from the... the um, it, uh, life casting to the sculpting to the the, the giant silicone f casting of a face and the painting and then the animatronics for something that's like 
three or four times the size of a human head. Yeah, they also have this, that the silicone on, on Lincoln can be removed in a matter of minutes with no tools. That's crazy. And replaced. I, I, by, so, the, the next goal should be to have Lincoln be able to move his own face. <laughs> right? Program in the, the Terminator effect. Don't need technician, not required. I can peel off my face and show you my true face. All the kids start screaming, <laughs> running out of the room. Very Disney appropriate. <laughs> Before we dive into the tech news, I, you know, I have something I want to get off my chest, get and it. I'm trying to think about the best best way to do it. And I, I was thinking about just writing like a ten page email to the entire no, tested you need, team. You gonna write an email? You gonna write a manifesto? I guess if it's ten pages long, I might as well call it a manifesto. Oh, you can use our uh, our the, pl- the t- tools that we've built in the tested platform to, to write it. Well, I'm also gonna cite some like really poor, make some like really poor jumps in logic too, and see how that goes over. Oh my goodness! Of course, we're we're going to talk some serious business now. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the big thing happening in tech this week. Uh, this anti diversity is that the best way to categorize it? I don't think it was anti diversity. It was just mi- misguided. I would indicate it felt uh, immature. Uh, so set up, set it up. All right. So a a junior developer at Google wrote. What uh, was termed a manifesto, a 10-page screed on their practices when it came to diversity and his thoughts on gender and... Um, it was diversity as it pertained to gender, yeah. not, not race or anything. It was... Um, and really about like some of the, the trainings and systems that Google has in place to, um, to really overcome certain biases. And, and it went viral, quote-unquote, internally somehow um and then leaked out to the press and gizmodo ended up publishing the full 10 page note and it had very strong reactions from um the internet community for for appropriate reasons uh, i think there is there's something that this guy is trying to really communicate that there's there's something sort of unfair or some practices that he doesn't seem to see working and he took this approach of writing this really long what I think he thought was very thought out and grounded in logic. Um, Scree, and I'm sure he didn't mean it to go viral. Yeah. I mean, I don't get malice in this, but it unfortunately did. And it, misguided is probably the most gentle way because the way I read it was it was it was malicious. Like mm. the, he hides so much of like front loads so much of like like. Brace mo- I'm not sexist, but yeah, there's a lot in of the front comma, of it. but yeah, yeah, um, and to a point where once you get to the like the third point of his like when when he gets to the the point he's trying to make, like I'm already braced, like holding myself ready to to brace to be like what, that's what his thing is about because this makes no sense whatsoever. That's why I use the term misguided because it just didn't sort of ring true. Um, but I, I would say so. Uh, a, a couple points that are key is he, he talks about gender in this article a lot. Um, and he, just biologically speaking, he gets a lot of stuff wrong. And there's a lot of um, biologists on Twitter and other mediums that have come out and, and talked about the way he's wrong. I actually thought the thing that uh, bothered me the most, just coming from my perspective, is he basically talks about research in, in fields like un- unconscious bias, other areas that... Um, I think there's some conversation on and just takes a giant dump on social science in general. Basically says like, none of those findings are valid. Here's my experience and why that's wrong. And he does so in the frame of like a evidence-based model. And I just like that, like you can't, social science is a science. Right. Like period. You may disagree with certain conclusions, but they're valid evidence-based findings and and he just sort of glosses over that in a way that runs just totally divergent to the whole notion of this i mean suffice to say also the response that google had to to this was delayed and insufficient and then now very uh 
I don't know if delayed and insufficient. Like it came out. When did it? Like, what's the timeline here? It came out on Saturday or Sunday. It came out over the weekend. Is my experience of it. And then their new VP of diversity published something as a response that really felt like a, a it felt placeholder. Half-hearted. Yeah. Um, and then and then the response from uh, their CEO. Um, he cut short his vacation. Came back. Yep. Did some it, stuff. Some and, just, and then just and then the employees fired. Employees fired, which. Seems like they didn't have the, the, the they didn't know how to respond. Well, I think they tried a response, realized that it did not create the um, the impact they were looking for, and realized a stronger response was worthwhile. Um, the reason we're partially talking about this is not just the manifesto itself, but some of the responses. And I think um, the most thoughtful one was from a former Googler. Um, what's his name? Uh, Yonatan Zunger, did you read this? Mm-hmm. Like an engineer sort of take um, about this manifesto. And what was really great about it is so much of the manifesto talks about um, how it, it's sort of unfair, how we're sort of, you know, um, creating systems that elevate um, women engineers in this way without them potentially being um, qualified for it. And what this this senior engineer who was at Google for a long time but recently left said was, you know, so much of what is encoded in here is this, the idea of an engineer's job is to code. And he's like, that is the easiest thing to replace. Like anyone can code or there's so many people out there that can code. But a real engineer, like a senior engineer, is really trying to make a number of people collaborate together um, to build better code. And this guy just basically put out a screed that makes it, will make no one want, want to work with him ever again. Mm. And so the, and he puts up this really thoughtful, I think, take on modern corrupt collaboration in the workplace um, and, and really like creating environments where you want to work with the other people around you. Um, and, it, you know, it's sort of a shot across the bow about how Silicon Valley operates in a lot of ways. Do you think there's going to be long-term fallout? Do you, do you think like this manifesto hits upon a a culture that exists here in the in Silicon Valley? I don't think the I don't think that. I think yes, to the latter point. I think it does reveal something about um, the culture in Silicon Valley that does need to be addressed. But I don't think that it's going to be the catalyst for any type of change. I think it's it's going to be more about the. The, the how the media and how people are reporting on it and how it fuels it really is a thing that's going to fuel both sides of the of, of this argument it's not just silicon valley either i mean i yeah. i feel like silicon valley should be the first place where it dissipates and goes away uh given the experience that we have but it's uh it's certainly prevalent here and everywhere and there's no other real hot take about it uh, outside of um i don't know there's something that I wonder how many people quietly agree with what he's trying to say at the core of this, mm-hmm. um, because there's something interesting there about talking to those people that that feel wronged in some way, or that their company is not not taking steps that that make sense that really, um, uh, you know, value um, value. Um, I don't know how to put this in the right way. I, I just really wonder how many people really re- this resonated with. It seems like a lot. It seems like there was a, there was a whole subgroup that uh, of people discussing that, um, and this was just the the biggest like the thing that got out. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Any other Google happenings though? Yes. <laughs> I didn't read this. <laughs> Someone tell me about Ray Kurzweil. Well, Ray has, I mean, Ray is probably most famous for being the person that's championing the idea of the singularity, the uh, idea that we can download our brains into machines and there'll be a a point where that technology overlaps. And a a few years ago, uh, I think it was two years ago, it might be three, he um, went back to work at Google as basically like their head of research, head Mm -hmm. of engineering kind of thing, role. And there's been a lot of conversation about, well, what's he been doing? Because we haven't heard as much um, from Ray as Coasting. before. He's Co- resting and vesting. Yeah. <laughs> so what has he been doing? He's been, um, like, wh- where do you go when your idea is singularity? Uh, you go to AI. 
Well, what's he doing with AI? But what's the implementation of AI that suits both Google's business business plan and also it is going to be interesting to him intellectually. This is where this is basically the sound of us trying to hand off the story to each other, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There's an unspoken rule about submitting stories <laughs> to Slack. Yes, that's right. I didn't submit uh, this. I guess it was me then. <laughs> um, <laughs> I totally faked my way through that opening. You really did. Set up more. I thought it was yours. <laughs> All right. Now, now people really know how this sausage is made. <laughs> no, we don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're done with it. I'm more talking. I'm more interested in the next thing. I'm, I'm focusing on okay. on Intel. Uh, okay. We're gonna hold off our conversation about um, about Google for for a bit. Um, I want to talk about Intel's new chips. Great. This is an exciting okay. week if you're a PC builder because on the Intel side, you have the announcement of the Core i9 series. And the Core i9 on the high end are now "quote unquote" desktop CPUs, meaning they're, they don't need your server motherboards. But uh, in, in the very near future, the high end of Core i9 will have how many cores? 18 cores. Okay. 36 threads. An 18 core CPU. When you know, just three years ago, we were uh, dumbfounded at the fact that you could get an eight core CPU on a desktop. Four was like the the natural. It seemed like a, a place where um, desktop CPUs was going to rest at four core, eight threads, increase the efficiency, power efficiency, hmm. ramp up the clock speed. Um, like six and eight cores felt like server territory. Now six and eight cores today, at least almost feels like you, it, it's easy to buy, cheap to buy a six and eight core CPU, especially if you're going to buy on the AMD side. So what does the i7 max out at? i7 is, uh, well, previously, so in terms of the, the chipsets with Haswell and Broadwell, you had the E class, which had on the high end eight core and then ten core, mm. and but those were thousand dollar CPUs. And the ten core, I believe, was uh, e- even more than that, significantly more than that. Um, so wasn't there a limit that they're hitting just because we're at fourteen nanometers and going much smaller than that was just not possible? Well, yes. Like the Moore's law in terms of um, in terms of shrinking the die size mm-hmm. was reaching reaching its point. So they were going to look for efficiencies in other places, and like and also the 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 the, um, the processor speed, right? Like getting mm-hmm. getting you're seeing most CPUs now turbo up to almost four gigahertz, a little over four gigahertz. But you're not we're not hitting five gigahertz. Like at some point, four gigahertz is like that much voltage, that much um, into the CPU. This that's what that's the speed you're it's going to get. Um, so it's about more adding more cores. Yeah. Um, and even with the cores, the way the cores were ramping up their speeds was wasn't very efficient like the cores uh would you know start at maybe like a three gigahertz and then turbo up to to four right not those exact numbers um but the way they would turbo up would be inefficient for like video gaming when if you could have a a four core system with uh, as opposed to an eight core system and the four core system would could turbo up to 4.5 because it was more stable for four cores to be at 4.5 gigahertz than eight cores to be at 4.5 gigahertz so the eight core system was going to have a lower clock speed but you have more cores so for multi-parallel tasks um uh for like encoding video it'd be still better than the four core system um so you, pc Builders had to kind of choose. If you're a gamer, you always would choose the four core system that would turbo up to the the, the max frequency because games rarely use over those two cores. On the uh, productivity side, especially the video editing side, and there are a ton of people now video editing. And I think this is one of those things: the convergence of like who's doing the work, the, where the workload has been shifting. I think PC gamers drove enthusiast PC markets for so long um, that. Intel and maybe other CPU and manufacturers didn't anticipate content creation being such an important part of the PC space. And now that there is 4K video, now there's 8K video, you know, reaching up to 4K and beyond. Um, and the, uh, con- uh, the software being uh, more accessible and the distribution platforms being more accessible and people hmm. being YouTubers and creating uh, Twitch streams. People want more cores. Um, on the AMD and the Intel side, now you have these offerings that could give you these incredibly powerful CPUs that we didn't even imagine we had three years ago. So this week, Intel or AMD is going to launch their Threadrippers CPU line, uh, which is, again, it's going to be pretty expensive. This is the, the step up from Ryzen. Um, and it's not expensive outside of reason. 
it's expensive in line with how previous chipsets when they came out came. It was it was relative. like the the thousand dollar range. Previously, yeah. you know, most people are going to spend you know two fifty two to three hundred three fifty on a CPU if you're building a gaming PC, a high end gaming PC, and if you were going to build a, a a workstation for video editing, you might spend a thousand dollars on a CPU or on a CPU. But if you uh, Today, if you want to spend a thousand dollars or a little more on a CPU, you get a Threadripper CPU with sixteen cores, thirty-two threads, which is incredible. And if you're on the Intel side and you want to get a Core i9X processor, you could get up to eighteen cores by the end of this year. How much though? Do they uh, that's gonna be like two thousand dollars for a CPU. So that's still gonna be in the high end, and that's what uh, mm-hmm. that's what Apple is gonna be putting into their. Um, their computers, their their iMacs, um, they're coming out at the end of this year. And was it the iMac or the new Mac Pro that they talked? New iMac, the new iMac. They're putting this 18 core one in there, the extreme one. Usually, they don't put the the super super high end one. They are. Wow. Uh, this is that's remember, a departure. Do you remember uh, the iMac Pro that they announced at yeah. the last Apple event? The one that that's going to have obviously this, for industry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is going to have that new i9 processor. Wow. You're going to uh, have to give like a kidney to get that. That machine, then it's gonna be expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're saying this is really just for content creators, not it's not gonna help gamers so much. Well, it, the way they can turbo, uh, they've changed it so that they can have a select number of cores turbo mm-hmm. up to max uh, max frequency, and that will mean that if you have this and you're spending the money on the content creation side, you you won't be sacrificing the gaming speeds, perhaps. I wish that using multiple cores wasn't such a manual process on the programmer's part. You know, ideally there'd be a way for the compute for the system to take instructions and the OS. Yeah, or the OS, or the or at the lower level at the, you know the motherboard to split it out to multiple cores itself. If you have so many at, at your hand, you know, in a less efficient way, of course, but that would be useful. Oh, you know what? A correction on my part: the new Mac Pro, iMac Pros, will not use these cores because they're using Xenon processors. You were so confident about I know. that. It was it was uh it, it was my my hope, but no, they're using the server processors because they uh, they use a uh, faster memory. We well, could hold that for the Mac Pro next year. That's right, that's right. Um, it's a it would be an interesting time to build a new PC, I think. Luckily for you, didn't you guys just build a new PC? We just built a new PC. Ryzen. We'll, we'll talk about that at the uh, the end of the podcast. Um, let's talk about some some Apple stuff. So, uh. First, this fall, we're, of course, anticipating a new iPhone, right? Yeah. And, and, th- yep. and there have now been, yep. I, I think, a just... A $1,000 plus iPhone, probably. Maybe even 1200 Yeah. Uh, there's now even a, a photo that came out yesterday of a, another cell phone case that showed uh, potentially a render of what the new iPhone looks like, though people mm-hmm. are very um, skeptical about it because, yep. because uh, it just looks like a... a a re-render of an, another speculative image, um, but something that also may get an update is the the, the Apple Watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they always wanted to put cellular into the Apple Watch, but it's just been a been a challenge. So, kind of meh on this I, whole concept of cellular inside. Well, they kind of meh on the Apple Watch. Period. Well, I've never had an Apple Watch. This is really a question but for Jeremy. But it fulfills that vision, you know. It fulfills yeah. the Dick Tracy, you know, Inspector Gadget. The so, watch does everything. But, it, like, it, there's two problems with cellular and, and watches for me. Like, one, it's just, first of all, it's the add-on expense because you have to pay now some extra amount of money for that cellular service. Probably $20 a month. Yeah. So, and that seem, that expense seems very limited in terms of its functionality unless you're, like, some sort of, like, athlete that's using this on a, on a real daily basis uh, to track some activity. Um, so that's one is the expense. Two is that it's going to... Uh, hurt the battery life and we already talk about these devices being limited in their battery capabilities you're basically getting a day out of them which yeah is fine for your phone but it's not ideal still you know in a watch system no they would they would have to solve that and so like are they going to reliably be at a day with the with the cell signals i mean we have some evidence from some of the other android watches that have have um, cell antennas in them that their battery life did go down like fifteen to twenty percent. Uh, I just don't. I can't see it being worthwhile. But what I mean, what are what are the user benefits uh, for a day to day user? I mean, what what are the things you would potentially want? Yes, not having your phone 
in your pocket, but it would require the watch design, the UI design, the apps to actually be useful. Like yeah. the hopes for this to make it worth the spending the extra money on one a new watch to um, the drain of your battery life and three, the monthly incurring costs of having a seller, you would have to have things like messages, mail, directions actually be useful on your watch, a thing you'd want to yeah. use. Well, everything but mail is useful on the watch, I think already. Uh, it's all that you'd have to use it by voice. E so Siri, Siri is the yeah. big potential killer app here. Uh, having a internet connected Siri that can that you have at your wrist wherever you are, regardless of what app you might want to launch on your phone and its counterpart. Um, the other uh, speculation is that this may accompany a big redesign of the watch that we're finally due for. Like when people talk about waiting for a quote unquote second gen Apple product, it's not just the second gen. We've already had this Apple Watch 2 version, but which is almost the same. It's thicker than the Apple Watch 1, but a is big it? leapfrog um, hmm. over that initial design. It, does the Apple Watch currently have Wi-Fi on it? Yeah. It must, right? Yeah. It has Bluetooth. I mean, it, like, Bluetooth. No, it has, it has Wi-Fi. Because that, I mean, that solves most of this problem with the cell things. If it has Wi-Fi, so even if you don't have your sure. phone around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can even be connected to your phone over Wi-Fi, over, yeah. the, over the internet. See, I think, that, oh, oh. I think that we're in such, like, this tiny use case of when are you without your phone, when are you without your phone without Wi-Fi around, and when are you without your phone without Wi-Fi that you need some utility on a watch. So there's yeah. a stopgap solution. Your You're saying the infrastructure, the Google Fi solution, it's, it's like the two different paths. You either put uh, cellular radios and everything, because the infrastructure for cellular is in place, yeah. or you try to build up a network of Wi-Fi, which is what Google has been doing with Google Fi, and have that be sufficient. I think those are both the same goal of having mm -hmm. everything be connected all the time to the internet at large. Um, What's going to be more convenient to users? Yeah, and I, I, I'm skeptical. There's a skeptical face. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will just be an option. You know, right? They'll they'll always just have the like the iPads. You'll mm -hmm. get the cell version or the non-cell version. You know, uh, something else that you should be skeptical of is that uh, viral video of the pilot. Did you see this? The what pilot. Was the, the video of a um, of a Singapore Airlines pilot, I believe, um, in the cockpit flying and then seeing another plane about a thousand they say a thousand feet away from it so there's like a, a, a jetliner uh-huh and the the co-pilot on the plane so he wasn't the one flying the plane sent an airdrop from one plane to another no bull s yeah <laughs> there is no no way theoretically if they were just a thousand feet away from each other would the Wi-Fi signals be strong enough? In moving at eight, like five hundred yeah. miles an hour? Yeah, no, I, don't, no. I, I don't think so. I didn't buy it when I read like the the story about. Um, I read it like a, a little piece where a, a woman was looking at a a, a guy in a car behind her, uh -huh. and he saw her looking at that, and he thought she was flirting with him, so he airdrops his number to her, and that's like twenty feet. And you, they were stopped. And I still don't buy that I think story. That would, I think that would totally happen. I think the tech would work. I still don't buy, believe, believe the story. story. I don't, yeah. Within the time of a green light, yeah. red light, to just visual. What's what's the, the universal sign for airdrop something to me? <laughs> Turn on your Wi-Fi. I'm surprised. Allow non-contact. I can't believe we're talking about airdrop because no one I talk to even understands it. I, I mean, I'm always the person that says... You think that's says, the best feature that's least understood? Yeah, yeah, it's great. Fire. If you have an iPhone user next to you, it's the fastest, easiest way to transfer. Or Apple, to, any Apple user on their ma laptop, on their, right. on their desktop. If you have a photo, you want to get it to somebody else. Everyone always says, email it to me. I'm not, check this out, AirDrop. And they're like, whoa. Well, it works best on the phone because it builds into the, the standard infrastructure of the phone. Your photos pop in the Photos app. Yeah. With... Uh, if you do it with um, with your desktop, it, it's still the, you have to drag the file pops in your desktop. Um, yeah, it's it's. I agree, much faster than email, but maybe less consistent if you're on spotty Wi-Fi or if the person you're you're trying to send it to doesn't understand. Like where it's the files only are good going. for small things. Yeah. Like we tried to air like during the live show last year, we tried to airdrop a presentation from one laptop to the other until somebody was like, you know, they still make these flash drive things. Sneaker net. <laughs> what, that was just like was that some what? weird non sequitur? No, <laughs> sneaker net. You know sneaker net. It's it's when you transfer things by yeah. foot. 
You with me on that? Yes. Okay. I got it now. But Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were actually setting up some some other story. Is that like the meat no. space of internet? Yeah. The physical hand handoff. So you guys know about Arduino? Yes. It's, yes. You've heard of it? Yes, I've heard of it. Um, there's a new CEO. Oh, what happened? Is uh, was the CEO before the guy Massimino Bonzi, the guy that invented it? No. <laughs> uh, no. So there was a this there was a new CEO. I believe he became CEO. Gosh, was it October of last year? Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Federico Musto, and uh, he he very quickly got a bad reputation because apparently here's the deal: this guy um, had claimed to have a PhD from MIT okay. of all places and an MBA from New York University. And the only problem with that is a small problem: he didn't actually attend either of those universities. That is Did a he problem. Seminar. Please tell me a little bit about one of those after school some after. <laughs> That's exactly what he claimed. He said that he was on a like a, a an exchange student program for two months. So yeah. this is very similar to a, a segment that John Oliver did <laughs> recently, where he questioned. He t talked about the the uh, the doctors who um, or the the medical specialists who vouch for like supplements, vitamin supplements for like radio show hosts. Yeah, yeah. And like there's a video clip where someone says, oh, I'm, a, I'm an MIT alum and, and I've graduated from here and here. And during the research, it just meant that they took a seminar once. It's horrible. At, at MIT. Apparently you can get away with this because he was CEO of, of several companies and no one had ever questioned this. The only problem was after he became CEO, he went to visit um, along with, you know, an entourage from Arduino. Oh, no. Um, Adafruit. In New York, mm -hmm. um, who is not only a, a huge distributor of Arduino products, but also a, a manufacturer. Yeah. So, like, big deal. Uh, where he was introduced to and met Lamore Freed, Lady mm -hmm. Ada of Adafruit, uh, who actually went to MIT. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, you know, he went there too, she said, oh, who was your advisor? <gasps> oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> and he quickly changed the subject. <gasps> And uh, she, she said she uncovered this. And she, yeah, she's like even greater and of a hero she now. She said, "You know what was your what was your dorm?" And he had no answer to these things. So they called the university. University has no record. They did the same for New York University. Same thing. So they uncovered this. And uh, wow! And don't mess with Adafruit. Like the serious thing was, he since becoming CEO was starting to remove some of the open source documents from a lot of the Arduino products. Uh, that'll make people unhappy. So the whole community was concerned. You know, not only did they have a liar. But they had somebody who was maybe not should be a member of the community, and then he released this ten-page manifesto. And people <laughs> were like, "What the hell?" So uh, one of the founders, one of the co-founders, is back in place as CEO, okay. and uh, Federico Musto is out. Is this a good thing? Like the the new CEO is there? Is it just like a promise to return to its open source roots, or is yes. it too early to tell? Well, it certainly is a promise to keep its open source roots. Yeah, cool. The actual. The real roots of, of Arduino is a little weird. Like you should Google this because the, the guy who really invented the product is not has never been a member of the company. Hmm. It was co opted by these other guys. Oh. Yeah. So there's even at the very beginning there was intrigue. Well, sounds like sounds like very common story in tech actually. Yeah. Spe with such especially with open projects. Um couple last bits of technology news. Um Spotify is now available on Xbox One. Now, no one cares. <laughs> I, the reason I think, I mean, people are reporting this, and it's apparently long awaited. And of course, a lot of people have Xboxes, and a lot of people use Spotify, so this feels like something that makes sense. Uh, for me, I really don't care because I don't think anyone really thinks of the Xbox One as a the same type of platform as an Apple TV because it's it consumes a lot of power. They abandoned that whole arc. You remember when they were pushing the Xbox One as a, a unified entertainment platform with voice commands and integrations with Netflix and all of those other services? They seem to have walked, Microsoft has seemed to walk away from that. So that's why it doesn't make sense is that they're walking away from it. So why, why, um, uh, you know, why is this a big deal? I mean, it's great. I mean, there's going to be some people that use it in that way, but I think it's limited. Um, God, also, I'm so cynical this week. That's okay. Uh, we have a new release uh, for three printer users out there. 
Uh, Simplify 3D is a slicer that we really like. Um, and it, if we're not using Cura, we're using Simplify. Uh, it's not free, uh, but they do have a new version, uh, version 4.0, that supposedly adds a ton of new features. I haven't used it yet, but we're going to talk to Sean about uh, testing some of these features, uh, including variable model settings, meaning that you can, for one model, have different print settings for different parts of the model for parts of a curve that you may need um, tighter, uh, uh, more dense printing. Um, and uh, that's super interesting. Also, better support for uh, dual head extrusion for um, um, for uh, a, a support material, dilutable support material, dissolvable mm -hmm. support material. If you haven't seen um, uh, Ben Krasnow, who runs a great YouTube series called uh, Applied Science, where he does deep dives into builds that are just nuts, um, he has a, um, I think he has a FLIR attachment um, for his camera. He did a whole series of of um, thermal imaging of 3D prints as they're going along um, as a way of identifying, um, as a way of really testing the the heat at the extrusion head of different 3D printers, um, which I think is really fascinating to look at because that's where a lot of failures come, it is either overheating or bad dissipation of heat. Um, so I can't wait to talk to Sean about that, about really leveraging thermal imaging as a way of yeah. ensuring uh, good prints. Uh, on the subject of 3D printers, one of my favorite YouTube channels is the Engineer Guy. Oh, he's great. Do you know him? Yeah. And so, I mean, I've learned so much from him. He taught, he did a cool video about. They're all really concise, but well edited, and he's very he's very well spoken. He talks about how microwaves work, how lasers work. Well, his most recent one this week is how um, SLA 3D printers work. Oh, fantastic! And he really gets into detail that I think even Sean could learn something from. Uh, it, there's a lot there about how, how the light you know, solidifies the um, the resin and why everything happens the way it does, the chemistry involved. It's really it's neat. It's a combination of oxygen and light, Norm. Oh, I was just about to say, I hope you could, do, 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 hopefully it would apply to the carbon 3D printing because I, I want to know. I'm still, still asking the question of how... <laughs> how oxygen and light can make those prints go so quickly. I'll put a link in the show notes to, to um, his channel. It's great because it combines a little bit of history too, which I think is oftentimes missing mm -hmm. um, from these conversations. Yeah, and this one, I guess, is specifically about DLP um, SLA printers, yeah. which is very similar to what Carbon. This isn't just the single laser moving back mm -hmm. and forth. These are full full images, and, and the uh, the resolution of those, print, of, of those projectors can determine not the layer height, but um, uh, the, uh, the I guess the, the the resolution of each layer of right. um, mm -hmm. uh, the X Y each layer, not the Z. Um, uh, last couple things: uh, driverless cars. What's this about? Yeah, so, outside of DC, I think it was in Arlington. Um, there was a viral video that went of a driverless minivan um, without any sort of like logos on it. And no one physically behind the, the wheel, unlike all the other driverless car tests that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and no scanners on the car. No scanners on the car. It turns out it's it's a bit of a hoax in sort of a funny way. Um, the driverless van actually had a driver in it. He was dressed up as a car seat. So he was there was a person in a outfit that looked exactly like the, the front driver's seat. Uh, and he was using his hands to steer, and he had the ability to see out this car. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, he's not just some guy pulling a prank for some YouTube channel. Like, actually, there's a bunch of YouTube clips you can see of people pulling the same prank at, like, drive through windows. But what he he's a researcher at Virginia Tech that is working on studying the reaction to driverless cars from other drivers. And how that's going to impact safety because, as we know, we are going to have pass through some valley where there's going to be driverless cars and there's going to be cars with drivers. And how does that world mesh together? And this is different than the other drivers' reactions to seeing a car with LiDAR sensors, things that there's are no very one in this car. recognizable as a test car. Mm -hmm. uh, this looks like a normal car. So how are they studying the reactions? Is it cameras pointing at other drivers? Is it studying the driving behavior somehow? It's not clear when we're recording this. I'm sure more will come out. 
Um, basically, they just released a statement that it was like, hey, that was us. That was Virginia Tech. That was part of a research study. Um, they like just confirmed it, but they didn't say how they were studying. Because right? I imagine they want to study more of the immediate driving on the road reactions less than the two days later internet viral video, viral photo reactions. We got this many media impressions. From exactly. Blessing. We got this many podcasts talking about our tests. Uh, okay, and oh, the uh, uh, Splunky, Jeremy. Oh yeah, it was yes. A- <laughs> Go. <laughs> We're talking about it today. Uh, so you guys played Splunky? Yeah, a little bit. I wasn't n- never the biggest into it. Me too. And I feel like we're gonna catch some flack for that because this is the gamer's game. I mean, people who play hardcore games they love their Spelunky. They uh, also love their PUBG. And I'm, I'm no, haven't true. played that for a that's while true. either. But Spelunky is a little more accessible. You know, you can it's a platform. Yeah, and it's a roguelike. So you're in, you're dead in 20 minutes, um, and it's a randomly generated dungeons within you know certain confines. Not dungeons, but you know whatever. And uh, it came out almost 10 years ago now. And, That's insane. Yeah. And the the designer of this is heralded as one of the great indie devs. Uh, and he really has done nothing except this re-release, which looks a lot better. It came out there, on There's consoles. a good no-clip on Spelunky, that video exactly. game the, documentary. You watched that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. There is an excellent one on, on that guy. Uh, and he really is a highly highly respected game developer, but he's, he, he's been in shadow mode for years now. Well, his project has been revealed. He is working with, uh, I, want, I want to say, four other developers, maybe, f- yeah, maybe three or four other developers on a new game called UFO 50. Guess how many games are included in UFO 50? 49. <laughs> 50. Uh, it's like mini games? Y- well, no, like full games. What? what? Yeah, NES style. Full, but they're saying you know almost full games. They're not like mini games, and they're saying this explicitly. They are not mini games. Each with different mechanics, or each with different yes, art styles. Totally different mechanics, but all fifty games share the same thirty-two bit color palette. Uh, thirty-two color palette, not thirty-two bit. Thirty-two color palette. Are they just t- takeoffs inspired by other so. classic NES games? I want to say it's like WarioWare, but each game is a full game, so you really can ex- could explore this it's whole thing. It's more fun if it is WarioWare because. If it's we're aware, the mini games are fun to jump into. Yeah, all immediately easy to learn, and with fifty, the rotation you could you could play a lot. But if if well, WarioWare, the game was you had to play all these games. Like yeah, you could throw it in for right. one minute thirty seconds. Right. Uh, no, I think that there's more to these games. I don't know if they all exist in the same universe. So they can't. It's not a party game. This is not a party no. collection. This is just a, a collection. All games will have a single player component, and a, a percentage of them will be co op or multiplayer competitive. Wow. How's this gonna be released? Uh, first on PC in 2018, okay. Okay. and then they're going to bring it to consoles. Uh, wow. But it's a, and they want it to be an easy buy, so it's not going to cost an arm and a leg. This so, is the kind of thing that would be great as a launch collection for an Atari console, dude. Yes, or or put in a small NES mini style, NES classic style Arduino based machine. Well, yeah. Then then you have to. You know, that would be cool. I mean, they're not making hardware; they're making That's games. The yeah. But this is ripe for packaging in a way. To put it on a window. But if, if it used an interface that didn't exist, th- that you could sell this because it, you know, as hardware. Interface meaning a controller yeah, system? Yeah, being a controller system. That would be interesting. I mean, th- th- there are keyboard and mouse games, right? These are or gamepad games. This is not what's happening. No, not th- what's this happening. is a yeah. gamepad game system. Right. But it's 50 games in one, and he's working with these other very reputable developers. Right. And it, so I'm excited. I think it would be difficult, for, more difficult for them to make a collection of 50 games based on a new control scheme than what they're doing, which looks like adapting the mechanics they know are tried and true and yeah, fun yeah. from NES and classic uh, classic 8-bit games. Yep. Um, and uh, finally, speaking of classic 8-bit games, uh, there's a new uh, upcoming piece of hardware called the Smart Boy. And uh, this is, uh, originally I think it was like a April Fool's joke, but it's a device that takes uh, your Android phone, it's Android only, and you mount your phone into it to turn it into a Game Boy. Literally a Game Boy that can read Game Boy cartridges. So you plug in. Whoa. It runs an emulator. Like hardware cartridges? Yes. Yeah. That's but amazing. You plug your Game Boy cartridge in the back, and then it decodes it, and then using an emulator, plays it on and your Android phone screen wow. with the USB-C, and then you, you have hardware buttons. So it turns uh, your old Game Boy and Game Boy Color games into something compatible, playable, and grippable on a modern-day Android smartphone. 
guess who has lots of old Android devices? Oh, meet people in this room. Yeah. This yeah. is completely legit, too. Like, yeah. it, it doesn't require any, you know, copyrighted code. That's well, cool. Well, it runs an emulator, and it, you're not stealing the code because... Emulators are fine. Right. Emulators are fine because you're using, still using the Game Boy cartridge. What they said is that, unfortunately, it only runs GB uh, and GBC, Game Boy Color games, mm-hmm. not GBA, which okay. that would be a big selling point because of... Uh, how fast, how long it takes to load the cartridge in? Because of the emulate, the legal, mm-hmm. they can't store the code locally, and so all the code needs to be transferred and then loaded on every time. Okay. And with the GBA, it would take a long time for them to load the code every time without deleting it and then running it through the emulation. So I guess what you really want is this for your controller, and then actually run the full deal emulation on your phone, and have all your ROMs on the phone. Yeah, but having the ROMs on the phone, they couldn't sell a device that lets I you know, store your ROMs on the phone. but if somebody found a way to make that work, that, and, that's what you want as a consumer. As a consumer, yes. You want to be able to put on a micro SD card all your ROMs. Exactly. And this is just the physical controller. But the fact that this lets you plug in, the, the fact that the legal requirement of them having to use legit cartridges. Yeah, I love that. Is actually what makes this appealing. And mm-hmm. more than just like a Bluetooth controller for emulators and ROMs on your Android phone. God, who still has those cartridges? I was at a, a game store in Santa Cruz called Level Up, which is amazing, and it had a ton of Game Boy cartridges. Dude, what? Is it really? Level yeah. Up? That sounds cool. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Hyperkin is the name of the company that makes this. Um, it's called the Smart Boy, and uh, I think it will be out. I'm not sure what the pricing is on this, um, but it's something to look forward to. It will be a real product. Um, that does it for technology discussion and news. I do also want to thank the sponsor again of this week's episode of the podcast, and that is Squarespace. Uh, whatever your next big idea might be, count on Squarespace to help you create an eye-catching online platform that brings it to life. Whether you need a portfolio to showcase your work, a store to sell your products and services, a blog to share your ideas, or you're getting married and you need a wedding website, Squarespace gives you everything you need to look like an expert right from the start. You can even get a unique domain which strengthens your brand to make it easier for visitors to find you. Plus, with Squarespace's award-winning templates, creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. You can add and arrange content and features with a click of a mouse, all updated immediately. No need to code or install or patch or upgrade anything ever. And if you do have any questions, Squarespace's 24-7 customer support can help you with any problem, no matter how technical or trivial seeming. Think of them as your very own judgment-free IT department. So make your next move and start your free trial at squarespace.com today and use the offer code TEST, T-E-S-T, to get 10% off your first purchase. Again, the code is TEST, which helps us run this podcast. Moment of science. All right, blast from the past. Favorite prop of <laughs> oh, no, Moment of Science shelf. is the East Antarctica map shelf. of Antarctica. So out on the finger, we've talked a lot about this Larsen Sea Shelf breaking off, but we're gonna go somewhere else in Antarctica today, gentlemen. <gasps> we're gonna go staying in the west of Antarctica. We're going to this little nook here. Mm. Um, there is a lake below the sea shelf there. Um, the ice elf there called Lake Woylands. I'm pronouncing that wrong. What's interesting about this lake is it has water in it, uh, but also has methane in it. And they're studying this particular lake for a couple reasons that are interesting. So as the, the ice melts, they're worried about the release of methane gas into the atmosphere. Methane gas is somewhere between 10 and 90 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So Scientists are deeply concerned about its release, and there's lots of areas in the permafrost where methane is being released higher in the air. This all sounds terrible, just like all of my Antarctica stories, but they found some reason for hope. So scientists drilled down into this lake and took samples out, and they found something slightly unusual in the samples. They Captain found- America's shield. <laughs> they found slightly less methane than they were expecting. And when they did an analysis of this, they found bacteria that lived down there that were just digesting the methane. Now, these bacteria lived in an environment where there's essentially no light because the light has to basically penetrate all the way through this thick ice sheet. So without any light and without any oxygen, because they're essentially 
underwater. There's a little bit of dissolved oxygen, but not much. Um, these bacteria had to find a food source, and they somehow evolved to eat the methane gas that was down there. Wow. Uh, that was below the self. And so there's some interest in really studying these bacteria as a way of consuming methane before it gets released to the atmosphere. Now, there's still some deep problems with this in the sense that methane is lighter than air. So it's not like we can easily control this and like shove a bunch of bacteria in this location hmm. that we've trapped methane because methane is really hard to trap. That's why. And, and by the way, this is the primary reason or one of the primary reasons cows and meat consumption is considered bad for the environment is that cows fart. They release methane. And they release methane and yeah. that goes up in the atmosphere. It's a bigger issue that how much land they consume, how much water they consume um, for the amount of calories they produce. But anyways. I assume so, that the amount of methane in Antarctica dwarfs the cow problem. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah? That's a good question. Right. I'll do some math and, and come back to you on that. Because there is a, I think there might be more methane trapped in these permafrost areas than are released by cows. Yeah. Um, but I have to double check the math. Have you ever heard the idea that uh, when you see old panes of glass, um, that they're a little bit thicker on the bottom because glass is actually a liquid that Dude, flows? Dude, stop it. You've really? never heard this? No. It, it's sort of a persistent uh, it's idea. Consistently that, thick or you actually see drip? Like you don't see drips, but you see like some warping. You know what I'm talking warping, about? Okay, yeah. When you've right. gone to see like right. um, ancient, you know, sort of uh, cathedrals and whatnot. But that, that's through by gravity, not because of like an like a. There's this persistent idea that glass is a liquid. Well, I mean, it is a liquid. It, that's sort of confirmed, and that it slowly over time flows down because of Wait, gravity, causing the warping. Glass on my car windshield is a liquid. Yes, that it's technically a liquid. I mean, for all intents and purposes, to us, it's yeah. not. Well, because it flows yeah. really slowly. And scientists finally figured out how much it flows. So I, I, I thought about this when I was in Westminster Abbey a couple months ago looking at the glass. So How they, do they evaluate that? They really have to find old glass and know exactly when it was made, how long it's been in that spot, and calculate gravitational forces? They actually did some analysis of the glass that was in Westminster Abbey, and it's been there since 1248, I believe. Um, and here's what they found. They found the flow rate of the glass due to gravity. And so for a change of one nanometer in terms of total thickness of the glass, with that like change in that flow, it would take one billion years for the glass to flow one nanometer. So Wait, wait, wait. Is this one nanometer of thickness or one nanometer of vertical height? Thickness, I believe, is so what that's a saying. weird metric for flow. Well, I mean, they did a viscosity measure. Okay, it's viscosity. Mm -hmm. So for glass to drip down from a certain pane of a certain what? length mm -hmm. to increase thickness at the bottom by one nanometer, it would take a billion years. Yeah, one nanometer. Just to remind you, is is like slightly larger than the thickness of an atom. <laughs> so it's it's not then how, that noticeable. How is it that we have noticed it? So it it's just a misnomer. It's a myth. Oh, this idea that the medieval glass has flowed downward is it incorrect. It's just the way they manufactured it. You right. just asked us if we've noticed that glass is thicker at the bottom. Trick it's question. not actually thicker at the bottom. It's uh. just people perceive it that way mm. because they're but closer it, to the bottom. But it turns out that it does actually trip. <laughs> At that very, 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 very and, slow and rate. And I can tell my in-laws that mm -hmm. glass is a liquid with a straight face? Uh, yeah, so if you found a you pane of glass... You gla anything <laughs> straight yes, face. Yes, you can. So if you found a pane of glass that was formed right when the Earth was formed, it's you know its thickness is increased by about four nanometers. Okay. That's incredible, right? Yes. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were at CERN a couple months ago. And uh, one area that we didn't vid visit, but a number of physicists talked about, was have you checked out the antimatter labs? Antimatter In factory. Yeah, antimatter factory is what they talked to us a, a lot about. And um, and sort of this is a weird thing out of science fiction. So Jeremy, stick with me a little bit about this. So imagine like matter is a is a thing, and it has an opposite. We'll call it antimatter. Oh, I like it. So if you take like a proton. There's a proton with slightly different spin that we're going to call its opposite. And when the, that proton collides with its antimatter component, cause a positron in this case, they annihilate each other. And there's a little puff of energy. So one of the fundamental questions of physics that we don't understand is there's a lot of matter in this universe, but there doesn't seem to be very much antimatter at all. 
And that's weird. We would think there'd be the same amount of antimatter and matter by some sort of classical definition. Hmm. Why, like, why would the universe not create the same amount? Mm-hmm. And so scientists have been searching for antimatter sources for a long time to basically study just their basic mechanics. And there's a great feature in Nature this month that really examines six different labs at CERN that are looking at this. Um, and one of them really focuses on the, the antiproton um, and how they basically produce it and then instead of accelerating it, which is what most particle accelerators do, they have to decelerate it. They take it from close to the speed of light down slower. But one of the tricks is it can't collide with any normal matter because it'll just annihilate. Mm-hmm. So they have to create the biggest empty space on the pla- on the planet that they can that has absolutely nothing in it. Pure vacuum. It's not just a vacuum. They just can't have anything get in there. They don't want to study the annihilation. The annihilation is interesting, but they want to control where that happens. Right. So they have to create these incredible chambers that sort of both generate antimatter, which largely doesn't exist here, and create an empty space where they can really control the environment. Mm. How big is this empty space? It's not very big, just because we're talking about stuff that's really small. Yeah. Um, but this this feature just about the mechanics of them a building a process to test this, uh, I think is one of the most interesting science process stories I've read in a long time. Antimatter is different than dark matter? Uh, dark matter is basically, we use the term dark just because we don't know what it is. So we know based off of calculations of gravity how much mass we expect the universe to have. And so by using those calculations, we also are able to experimentally say this is how much mass in the universe we see based off of light emissions. Um, and those two numbers are, are different by a, by a big factor. So that's why we call it dark, is that we know there's mass out there that we can't see in the, in the universe. So it sounds like it's like a thing, but it's not. It's just, meant, it's just sort of an, uh, a name given to, like, uh, we don't know. Got and it. dark matter is different than the blackest matter. <laughs> the blackest matter? <laughs> That sounds like a Cards Against Humanity card. That's right. Um, there is a new paint out there. We talked about this a while ago. There was something called Vanta Black. Yes. The blackest black. So black that um, when you shined a laser on it, you wouldn't be able to see the laser dot on it because it would actually absorb the light from the laser. And it did this through a series of carbon nanotubes that would bounce the laser light back and forth and dissipate it as heat. And this stuff was amazing because you literally couldn't see shapes in the actual uh, device. So if you haven't clicked the story, click it. Um, but the problem was that this Vanta Black, um, which is designed, it's not like paint in a traditional sense. It's a coating. And just with um, it. And it was only, it was bought up by an artist. The artist was the they only. They licensed it. Yeah. Licensed, he is the only one who can use it. Um, which has been controversial. So yeah, so uh, you imagine being a member of the artistic community where it's like, here's a new color, only one person can use this new color. The the art was not the application, the art was the buying of the color. Exactly, so the license. there is a new black out there that's uh-huh. similarly designed with some nanotube oh. things that's slightly different. It was actually developed as part of a NASA project in 2000. Two, I think it was. Um, Different enough to skirt any uh, problems. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So what they did was they made a gummy bear in that, that was out of cast iron that is in this color. And Jeremy has a picture up of his screen oh, of, 3D. This, of a 3D gummy bear that's sitting on a color wheel. Yeah. And then they took that, that bear and placed it on a black circle. Uh-huh. And you can scroll down, Jeremy, and see... That's what the gummy bear looks like. Yeah, it looks like that. You can't see it. You got to see this in person. This is like you VR. You totally I mean, have to see it in this person. This doesn't work in photos because anybody could Photoshop that. Yep. You're like, well, what does that really Just look like? Crop that out. Fair and enough. Black. Except this was uh, this is an article written by a journalist, and there is a scientific paper associated to this. So, I'm not, oh, I'm not saying it's a farce. Yeah. I'm saying you you want to see it. You you totally want to see it. But essentially, the the gummy bear disappears on the black circle. Yeah. Because there's, it's so black you can't see any features of it whatsoever. So this pigment it, is called Singularity Black as opposed to Vanta Black. And two different companies, this is Nanolab, who has Singularity Black, and Nanosystems, which has Vanta Black. And uh, Singularity Black is available to bl- buy uh, in several hundred dollars. will get you quarter liter. We got to get some. 
to I, do what? But the applic <laughs> it's not just the paint. So you actually need to it's the application of it is its own process and the um, it's not a very secure process too. So once once you've coated something with this, mm -hmm. it very you can't touch it. Because once you touch it, it ruins like it flakes off or oh. or you can the way you add to it. So the applications are very, very limited. Interesting. And like you said, unless we had a dynamic range camera that would and in every possible lighting condition yeah. to test this, uh, there's really no point. We'd get novelty of, of looking at it, but no. I, mean, I, yeah. I want some artists maybe to pick this up and put it at the MoMA and That's then go, thing. go visit it and, and take a look in person. Or like maybe the lobby at the tested live show. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Do that. I'm betting, I'm betting once you try this black, you never go back to regular black. Internet commenters, come <laughs> after him for that. <laughs> I, I have two more quick things. So uh, we've talked about the Impossible Burger on the show. It's a, uh, it's a burger that um, uses a soy-based uh, hemoglobin in so that the, the meat actually bleeds a little bit. It has Heme. this color. And yes, heme is the term they use for it. And a New York Times story came out uh, either Monday or Tuesday when we're recording this. Uh, using Freedom of Information Act requests, they got information from the FDA about the FDA's thoughts about heme being added to this burger. And the FDA raised some serious questions about this soy-based hemoglobin being added because it hadn't been tested as an allergen. And the FDA was not having it. Now, the FDA doesn't can't re regulate this additive in the way it does with, with, with drugs. So this is sort of a voluntary set of guidelines. So they're not going to take the burger off the market. But the FDA does raise some concerns that now I think Impossible uh, Burgers, at least at the, at the time of recording this, hasn't officially responded and is probably going to say a few things um, in regards to the safety of this of this additive going forward. I still haven't had an Impossible Burger. You have. I have. Yes. And it's delicious. Um, I would totally have it as a on the regular substitute for a burger if I'm looking for that type of burger. But um, I don't think it would replace ground beef in my life. Uh, but if I was going to a ballpark or I was, I was eating out for lunch and I felt like I didn't want to have a big bar burger, I, I would totally eat this. Well, I don't. I, this this shouldn't raise like huge alarm bells in terms of the safety, but it is an open question that the company is going to have to answer. And finally, the return of the science video you should watch this week. Um, there is a great close up of baby fish um, early in their lifespan moving their face like quickly, like hundreds of times a second. And the reason they're doing it is to essentially, it helps them, these exercises they're doing by moving their mouth so quick actually changes the shape of their head. And it is an adorable little video of these fish doing mm. exercises. Baby fish creep me out. Baby fish creep you out? Why is this happening? <laughs> All right. Are we moving on? Uh, that's it for this week. All right, then. Then... <laughs> <laughs> the VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week This is what happens when we record on a Tuesday Not a Wednesday or Thursday off. Everything is off this week Thanks for sticking with us uh, Let's get to the VR Minute So uh, a bunch of VR news uh, this week Let's start with Um Quill is back. Quill. Dude. Well, Quill's always been around. No, but they shut down the studio responsible for making it. Yes, the Story Studios uh, disbanded, unfortunately, um, and Oculus decided to fund, put funding elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but Quill, the tool that was developed for, by, I don't know if by or for Story Studio mm -hmm. uh, to, to do Dear Angelica, um, has people have still been using it, and Oculus is still continuing to support it. Yeah, and that was not clear when they shut down the studio. So... Is there a new update? There is a new update. They've added uh, all kinds of things. Um, I mean, there's a whole list of things. There's 360 mono stereo image support, mm -hmm. 3D sound, uh, fix the line tool, FBX exporter. Oh, that's good. All kinds of stuff. So this is a, it, it's, it's interesting because it's a very different tool than Medium, and the updates to Medium have been pretty great. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, in terms of following artists on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, I find that some artists love using Medium to do some of the, the roughing out of the forms and sculpting. And some artists are just 
really into quill. Yeah. Um, they're so different in terms of their aesthetic styles. I'm not sure what is more useful for their workflows. Like, is quill better as a like a storyboarding concept art, or is medium hmm. better? Um, for that, or with medium better just to do a, a first pass at a, a new creature design, uh, but not as great for designing environments. I would imagine that medium is more practical in its applications. Like you could really take your medium models into anything. You could 3D print them, you could use them in game. Well, things. the meshes that come out of medium aren't fantastic. They're not as detailed as, as you would see them because there is a lot of in game, um, in engine tricks, post processing effects. Uh, in medium. Yeah, but it's a way to model. You know, it's a way to create right. 3D models to begin right. with. You could you tweak them elsewhere if you need to. But the quill stuff seems to li- more or less live in quill. I mean, it's they're beautiful, but it, and it is its own, mm-hmm. you know, its own canvas, its own platform. And maybe it's one of those things that as Facebook develops its spaces and its its metaverse, that the, it, these tools get built into. I would love um, that in, into their virtual spaces, collaborative, um, for collaborative use cases. Uh, for people who've been waiting for wireless VR, now it's something that we're not anticipating being a big release for our, the headsets you know, for the next you know, year or so, but third party people are working on it. TBCast is probably the most well-known one. They were funded as part of the Vive Accelerator program. We saw them at CES. I was pretty impressed by, uh, the, I like what I saw with the the demo I got with TBCast at CES. It uses a 50 gigahertz wireless signal mm-hmm. to transfer. Safe for the brain. <laughs> Well, I mean, that seems like the higher the 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 you know the, the hertz rating, the Man- bandwidth, yeah. bandwidth, the closer you have to be to the transmitter, and the less the that you uh, and any um, obstacles. Exactly. So um, you have, but VR is a perfect application for that. You got line of sight, same room, and mm-hmm. you've got you know. In fact, you need line of sight. It's ideal for, for many of your applications. Yep. So it is ideal for that. Well, TBCast is one step closer to reality because it has FCC approval in the states. So I know it's it's going out to um, international audiences early because it's an overseas pro- uh, project, but there is going to be a TV cast for the Vive at first and then a separate SKU for the Rift, and we can't wait to test it, but this is a major hurdle for it being a real product that you can buy. And um, How much? I think it was like, I want to say $350 um, for mm-hmm. early pre-order. I don't think they've announced what a full MSRP for release, but okay. what is a price you would pay for wireless VR today? Um, mm. No, right? I don't think so. I, I'm also. What, what I'm asking, what what is a reasonable price? You I would pay? think a hundred bucks, and, and it's not that it's oh, not the technology is worth it, or nor do I think the price is worth it. Is where I interact with VR is in my office, mm-hmm. and there's limited value in my small office to be wireless at this point. My, I, I was incorrect. Two four two fifty, not three fifty. My problem is with uh, the boundaries, is with hitting things around me in VR. Even with the the all of the safety precautions that are built into the systems, I still lose myself in these environments and I end up hitting the wall or something off my desk. It's not so much getting tangled up in the in the cable, although that is, you know, uncomfortable. I don't like having that tether and I look forward to when it's gone, you know. Uh, you think 250 n- is too much? Natively. I, it's not worth it to me. Really? For liberation of... I guess it this depends. This is one of the things that I, I, I don't think... I don't feel like there's a broom scale killer app yet. I mean, I, I think that Echo Arena is fantastic, but I don't. I think it's more of a 360 app than room scale. Well, you need 360 no matter what, mm-hmm. right? The, the, you're not going to get the benefits of tetherless VR un, unless you're already in a room scale 360 environment. Yeah, um, which is why I think launching the Vive makes a lot of sense to start with. Uh, I don't. It's one of those things that I think it's going to be more appealing in use than on paper. <laughs> that once you use it, once you can't go back yeah, right. from wireless. Well, we, I've tried the backpack, and it is very highly compelling. It's a it's a liberating experience, as you said. I just don't know if it's worth that if it's worth the extra money, especially when I know in the not too distant future I'm going to be investing in the next generation of VR. And you think it's going to be built in the next generation, or that next generation yeah. will be compatible because of not, because because of the the bandwidth for, for, for I right. don't know. So for for what they designed TBcast for. Like, will it, the question is, will it scale up if once we're going beyond the current resolutions of our VR headsets? Right. Uh, if we're going to go to 4K headsets, is that going to fit over this wireless signal? Yeah. I, well, I think if you're Oculus and HTC and you're you're watching this really closely, because if it really takes off, if TP guest sales are incredible, that's really strong indication that wireless has to be part of the of the next generation. Yeah. I'm not convinced it it does at this. I don't think there's a market articulated. I think eventually we'll get wireless, but does it need to be in Gen 2? 
versus 4K, like Norm was saying? I don't, I don't think so. Right. Well, I think the, here is where you see this delineation and, and where Oculus is making the very clear delineation and even to some extent Vive is on the HG side between two categories of headsets, a tethered headset that's going to be the best in terms of the visual fidelity and the graphical quality um, and then maybe the tracking even and something that's going to have but not all that feature parity but it's going to have the baseline requirements for inside out tracking that's going to be on the wireless side but local processing if the rumors prove true that Facebook is making a wireless headset that's compete with Gear VR self-contained unit then they might the lessons might be learned that the wireless benefit of that uh it outweighs the need for high graphical fidelity. But that's all different, also a different type of wireless. If you're talking about a, a standalone Gear VR competitor, uh, that type of wireless isn't necessarily room scale. That wireless is just something that you can use wherever you are, whether it's on the couch, in bed, in your office, um, to take from room to room, uh, but may not even take advantage of full 360 room scale. It's also going to add weight. I wonder how much they weigh. Did you, uh, I did, think it, it didn't weigh that much. To wasn't me. that big a I mean, problem? It was the battery was a, 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 yeah. a belt clip, so oh, the battery okay. is a big thing. Okay, the receiver and transmitter that's smart. Um, on top of the headset is is pretty lightweight, but it will need you will need a clip. I mean, what I did at the at the CSM was literally have a giant lithium ion battery in my back pocket. So you're saying Vive is going to come out first? Yeah, there's no um, release time frame for the Rift. No, Q2 okay. for we're past Q2 right now, so it, it's got to be soon, I think, for for TBCast on on the Vive. But I can't wait to try this out. And um, yeah, I, I want to be tethered. For, I want to be tether free. Yeah. Um, other uh, things in VR. Uh, so, Star Wars, big property. Now, uh, ILM, ILM X Lab experimenting. Did you just say Star Wars, Wars big property? <laughs> yeah. Obvious. <laughs> obvious statement is obvious. Uh, but it's it also uh, we're seeing some of uh, some VR applications perhaps for Star Wars. Um, are, you, are you going backwards? Yeah, we're going okay. backwards. Yeah. Did you test out the Lenovo AR? Star Not Wars? yet. We're hoping to uh, sometime in the future. So, Near but what's future. what's the news now then beyond that AR piece? This is Star Wars having a, someone who's got the Star Wars license that may be exciting, the Void. So they did the, a partnership with Ghostbusters not too long ago that was a huge success by all accounts. Uh, it, we we still have yet to, to visit the void. I know, but I'm, we need to get over get there. Gotta get that trip to Utah. Hey, Adam and, tried it out at TED, right? He did. Yeah, uh, we did something similar with Nomadic, and it's great. Like it really is. I love it. I love I totally feel, believe it. feeling virtual reality. Is it backpack style with the void? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so th- they partnered with Disney, right? That's so gonna be incredible. It's gonna be incredible. I mean, we're assuming this is for Disney. Young Padawan, Lane. put on your training backpack. <laughs> oh, <laughs> put man. on your Yoda. <laughs> your processing, your graphics processing Yoda. Gary's going to be back with another take, this time on VR training account. Oh, Jedi King, imagine Jedi. if the computing backpack you put on for the Void was Yoda with an animatronic head and you have audio from behind you, but you're also carrying the backpack as you're using force powers in VR. It's yeah, gonna, go it, it's going to be called Star Wars Secrets of the Empire, and it will hit both Disney resorts in the States this holiday. So Wow, that's soon. So these are stopgap solutions ahead of... The big Star Wars land. Yeah. Gal- Galaxy's Edge. Galaxy's Edge, whatever they're going to call it. Uh, and it makes sense that they're contracting with other companies to create these these um, location-based experiences. I'm, I'm excited because this may be a, a first mainstream uh, you know, a- application of theme Main, park VR. What, what mainstream you, here in the West. I mean, yeah. v- theme park VR is common in the East. But they're not moving people through those as m- many as... Disneyland is moving people through no. those parks every what day. What do you think this is going to be like, though? Because Disney is, you know, famous for having efficiency in their rides, and you know, uh, it's a small world was going to be a, a walkthrough, and then you know, Walt Disney was shown that if you put people in boats and push them through, you can push ten times as many people through an hour. I don't see that happening with VR. You know, it's like laser tag. There's a lot of gear to put on. You have to get in there and probably watch an orientation video, and then you have to experience this thing and then dismount, and they have only so much room and only so many VR headsets. I don't know if everyone who shows up at the park that wants to use this thing is going to have an opportunity. Uh, my feeling is that Disney is probably underestimating the is going to underestimate the popularity of this mm. if you think of what the void is going to set up on the low end on the the most basic end knowing that they've made this deal is a pop-up 
pop up as an analogy, right? You have a part of, whether it's a Hollywood Studios or Disneyland Park, what would typically be a storefront or something, right? A retail store gets converted or backspace converted into some type of void experience, which is not cheap to set up. Uh, but that's that's still running very few people in. It's going to be a, a kind of like sideshow attraction as opposed to right. a big, you know, running thousands of people through a Star Tours-like attraction. But I think the word's going to get out soon, especially with Star Wars being a big franchise and VR being compelling as we know that people are going to want this. And so even if the experience is on net bad for the attendees, because I don't think as nearly as many people who want to go through this are going to be able to, be able to go through this. What it's going to bring to Disney, though, is the fact that VR is going to be compelling. VR plus Star Wars, VR plus any of their franchises, compelling, and maybe get them to really seriously invest in putting these into their theme parks, which is what we need. Yeah. Um, I don't, th- I mean, on the flip side, I guess maybe they've built a great enough, for, maybe the void can scale. Maybe they have factored, maybe it's going to be more than just a pop up. Maybe it's going to be, you know, multiple rooms and running hundreds of people through, you know, an hour or so. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel that's the case. Cause if that was the case, it would be an undertaking as big as setting up a new land or a new, a new ride attraction, which it doesn't sound like this is. This sounds like a partnership to test the waters of VR. Um, which, which can only mean that I think people are going to be disappointed that they can't get to experience it. Um, how long will the experience be? Right. You know. Right. And, exactly. And, and how do they? What kind of uh, protection do they put on the headsets? Decrediting. Yeah. It's going to be it's a it's going to be a gauntlet because there's going to be no theme park setting, on location VR setting as intense as a Disney theme park with the regulations, with the safety. It's not going to be like going to the mall. I hope that, that the Void partners with uh, Ready Player One. That would be well, cool. Well, they've already partnered with Vives. I don't know if the studio is going to have multiple VR partners. Uh, maybe, though. Um, last a bit of software, uh, Killing Floor Incursion is going to come out, I think, next week, the 16th. This is, uh, is that the zombie game? It is a zombie game for yeah. the developers of a Killing Floor. We played a bit at OC, mm-hmm. no, no, at um, uh, GDC uh, multiplayer. And... Mm-hmm. Um, I'm excited for this. Co-op. Co-op. Yeah. So there are maybe some similarities between this and uh, Gunheart, which is the the multiplayer VR Mm -hmm. uh, co-op shooter from Drifter. And I've been playing some Drifter recently. Gunheart. Or sorry, some some Gunheart recently. And I think I I don't find it as fun as I do like the Rec Room Quest. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, did, did you just play with random people online? Random people, which is fine. People can drop in the games. Okay. Which, like, it's, it's a great thing that people can actually drop into. You can start a mission, play solo, and so yeah. you can jump in, leave. And the people have been great. Like The people have been fun to play with, conversation, helping them test out the weapons and try their, their stuff. And But I'm still feeling like there's not a lot of great strategy to it, largely because of level design. Gunhart's levels are big. Like enemies are far away. There's a little bit of auto aiming help, and so, and rec room levels are small. They're almost claustrophobic. Um, you're still teleporting around or, or strafing around, but I felt like a lot of the cooperation and a lot of the that came uh, that we saw in in rec room was necessitated by the level design. Okay, and I don't feel like Gunheart facilitates that as well. Now I have high hopes for Incursion. Um, because what we played at um, at GDC was more claustrophobic. We felt, did feel more like tunnels and rooms, yeah. as opposed to j- large outdoor environments. The way that they handle teleportation is different too. There's a, as I recall, there's a cooldown. So as you, if you teleport, you then see this. It's an interesting mechanic. You see this ring go out from your body, mm. and that's the radius to which you can teleport. Mm-hmm. And you have that the, and basically as a resource. And the killing floor people are, have been very proud of how satisfying their um, their their uh, weapon models and the hit point accuracy and the the d- uh, death animations for enemies like it was really satisfying to shoot heads off zombies to use melee weapons to chop zombies to bits uh, whereas in in something like um, gunheart like this bugs the death animations were just they're just exploding bugs I disagree about the chopping that, you that, didn't like that, that? That's where the illusion falls apart because you don't feel it, you know? Mm. I, whereas I feel like with the pistol, it works a little better. Right. Um, and then uh, there's an, also an update to Dead and Buried, if people are still playing that. It's a big summer update. Uh, they have mixed reality support 
in the game now, uh, which is something we should definitely try out, figure a way to try out. Um, I think Oculus wants to bring that to, to sort of their platform. That mixed, they, mixed reality? Yeah, I think they're working to actually bring that it is. To, devs, well, to devs first. Yeah, I mean, Nate talked about that when we, we chatted with him last. Yeah. Like, there is some back end that allows devs to, to integrate that. Um, we just haven't seen... I mean, yeah. it'd be great for devs to use, be able to use to sell their games and to create videos and ads, yeah. but for us, I think it's more interesting for how users can, can build that and, and, and stream video and record their own sessions um, or let people in, you know, in, in the room watch it in, in a different way. What else? You can capture 360 screenshots and, and video. Mm-hmm. That's neat. Yeah, the 360 stuff is always always neat. Uh, did you try the Spider-Man VR? Yeah. Did you try this? this yeah, uh, yeah, we actually talked about the week you were out when Zach was here because he, he was the only one who had tried it. No, no, no. This is, this is not the official one. Oh. The when, official one I tried as well, and I didn't. And then Zach yeah. talked about it when... Um, no, we, we were talking about that. Zach said he had... Tr- uh, I think Kishore was out. You look like Norm. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, you're right. Uh, Zach had talked about how at the end of this... Spider-Man VR demo that Sony had put out to promote the Spider-Man Homecoming film, you got a, just a little taste yeah. of what it would be like to be Spider-Man and then the demo ended because really it was a promo tool. You're mostly just shooting balloons and stuff on a rooftop. And that demo is fine. It you know, looks fine. So what's uh, this one you're talking this about? This one is a user-made uh, Spider-Man demo, completely unlicensed. Really? But it's really an execution and web-slinging. Is you, do you I encourage s- you to download it. And do you swing? You swing. Huh. Oh, wow. And there, it's not perfect. There are things that I think could be improved. Like the wall climbing is really slow. You don't feel like you have the strength of Spider-Man. But if you get into a, a good rhythm of, of web slinging, like putting your hands out, holding the grip button mm-hmm. on your controller and shooting and then pulling yourself through the world, huh. it feels incredibly satisfying. Really? And it feels like a mechanic that it could be explored. Um you know, obviously it works great for Spider-Man because in your head you understand how he moves. Uh, but it's, it's one of those, it's, it's free to download. I think there was a link on the, uh, the Oculus Reddit. I'll, put, I'll find it and put it in the show notes. What, what is it called? Because I'm not seeing it right away. Um, I will. The Homecoming is the official one. Yes, yeah, so this, is, this is not that. Um, I'll have to find a. It's on Steam though? It, it's not on Steam. You it's just, on Home? It, it's, oh, it's just out you there. You just download a zip file, <laughs> unpack it. Old school. And, and run it. Yeah. But totally worth trying. And it may not be something that will be around for a while because uh, they'll need to modify it um, for uh, they need to modify it for for release because it, it, it's not it's an unlicensed thing. Yeah. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Um, this would be a good time for me to apologize for last week, where uh, in my recounting of my wonderful time I had at Pinburg, I appear to have doubled the number of pinball games that we played. Uh, we only played 40, not 80. <laughs> it felt like 80. <laughs> I guess it felt like it could have been anything, because it was nonstop. The second, second Hamilton reference. That's right. No, it could have been... It felt like it was non-stop. Uh, right. So it, we only played 40 games over two days. So but still, it felt like a lot. Uh, we just put up a review of the Taz 6 um, 3D printer from Lulzbot that mm-hmm. Sean has been using. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has a bed size of almost a foot by a foot. And he, he's printing some scaled up mercury capsule parts with it. He did a comparison between that and the Ultimaker. Um, and the Ultimaker, which... Could print also as big. They're both very expensive. Not as big. Not as big. Oh, the, Ultimaker's about eight eight inches. Sorry, he did he did a smaller piece on the Ultimaker okay. with a massive piece on the on the Lulzbot, um, on the Taz. But uh, Ultimaker print quality was better on the Ultimaker overall. But what you're paying for here is the bed size. But he was very happy with uh, the prints overall. It does seem a little bit. So here's here's a question. He, we were unsure about how to talk about this, whether it was a pro or con, or whether we could let it slide. It's a $2,500 machine, but many of the parts are 3D printed. Yeah. And that was surprising mm-hmm. to us because, yes, it's a lot of money to create tooling and to manufacture parts and to, to have it injection molded. But when you compare the industrial quality of the uh, Ultimaker, mm-hmm. that's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and same price. Yep. But functionally, they're the same. So do you 
dock a company for 3D printing some of its parts. If they're 3D printing them the highest quality, the most infill, you know, and, and they work, um, is that, I mean, if, if, the, if you're on board for 3D printing as a way of manufacturing things, can you dock <laughs> it for actually doing that? That's funny, yeah. Right? I, I don't think so. I mean, as long as its durability is on par with um, mass-produced elements, are they are they selling the idea that you can print your own parts to fix your yes? It's all. It's op- not only are they selling that idea. The memory, the SD card that comes with the printer comes loaded with all those parts. That's kind of cool. <clears throat> yeah, you can do it whatever color you want, I guess. And these parts are durable. They're just gears and things. They're not going to break. But I I agree with you, Norm. I think that the way that the machine looks is important. I know that that Sean's, one of Sean's concerns is just the amount of space it has. So if you're looking at a Task 6, definitely measure the footprint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, as mentioned earlier, we did a a PC build recently. We put together a Ryzen-based computer, a 1700X-based CPU-based system that now our producer Gunther is using to edit basically all of his tested videos. And it is it is awesome. It's fast. It's a three hundred dollar CPU that performs um, almost as well as one of those eight to ten core Intel chips that cost a thousand dollars plus a couple of years ago. Uh, encoding 1080p video, H.264, high bit rate at less than a rate faster than uh, one second for one second video. Is that not GPU accelerated? No, encoding video is um, hmm. it rendering uh, effects in Adobe Premiere. Um, some like the warp stabilizing or or uh, some of those effects is GPU accelerated, but the output is CPU. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and then any updates on your Glowforge testing and usage? Uh, no, actually, no. I I found a really great way to connect um, my duct though. They they on Amazon they sell several different modular attachments so that you can have a duct that goes from the little dryer duct on the back of the Glowforge to a you know and someplace outside. And um, the one that I settled on is, is, is magnetic. So oh. it feels very futuristic. Like I, I just pick up this disc and connect it to the other disc and it goes junk. And it's perfectly sealed. Like nothing gets out. So you're plugging and unplugging your duct as, as you go? Yes, because oh. it's not right up against the wall. Oh, okay. It's not on like sort of here where it's on, you know, you don't want it out all the time. Right, right. So um, in order for me to walk in this area, I have to take the duct off or let's step over it. But, but the seal's good. Seal's great. So that it's, you, you can't miss it. Magnetic um, dryer duct um, adapter. That's smart. On I mean, that's really I mean, smart. It, one of the benefits of having a small, relatively small laser cutter is that you can put it on a cart to move around and it's going to be durable yeah yeah it's great um the other thing that i tested was my brother-in-law is an architect and uh, he's curious about putting his sketchup models he sketches in sketchup uh some of the architecture that he works on and he wanted to put them into vr oh and i said well then you got to be able to export that into unity uh and in fact unity is supposed to import sketchup uh, projects natively i couldn't get it to open up his but I did find that there are several products out there that just skip the whole game engine entirely. So if you ever mess with SketchUp and you want to throw it in a VR, um, I looked at two that, that work relatively well. One is called Prospect, and that's just dumb. It's just super simple. You just give it your SketchUp project and you can walk around in VR. Unfortunately, the rendering looks a little bit like real-time SketchUp, mm. which is to say it's not great lighting. And Shape Shark, sh- I'm sorry, Shape Spark, which has much better rendering. It re-renders the, all the architecture but you have to place your own lights and you have to tweak a lot of settings. So it's more manual process, but the rendering is uh, is superior. It does, to bake the light maps, it can take several hours Wow! to do properly. Yeah. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's time involved, but it's it's neat how uh, simple you can do this with. That's why you want an 8 to 18 yeah. core CPU system. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I got two... Um, Two things uh, I want to recommend or, or let people know about, not necessarily recommend, but uh, Mastrop, uh, they have a new pair of uh, headphones that they are releasing in partnership with Hi-Fi Man. So when Patrick came and talked about his planar magnetic headphones that he loved, those HE 400s, uh, those are like $400 plus headphones. Uh, Mastrop is doing a version of those that may not be exact sound signature, uh, but are Still planar magnetic, and they're 170, which is a ridiculous price for planar magnetic headphones. Hmm. Uh, they may not be as good quality if you are an audiophile and you have $600 headphones, and you can notice the very like subtle differences on the highs and the lows. Uh, but if you 
are looking to get planar magnetic headphones, uh, 170 bucks is an incredible price. You may need an amp as well because um, you can't just run it off your phone. It'll be a little quiet. Um, and then uh, a friend of ours, uh, Walt Williams, who wrote um, Spec Ops The Line, he's actually one of the writers. Uh, he worked at 2K Games, did a, uh, worked on Bioshock uh, 2, I believe, and then also um, is now co-writing the new Star Wars game. He has a book coming out called Significant Zero, and it's about uh, writing for a triple A video game. So if you are interested in video games industry, um, it's a book coming out soon, and uh, he's a friend, so I just want to give him a, a shout out for that. Uh, and I think that's it for this week. Um, we will be back next week with another podcast. Um, I think it'll go smoother. We're going to read all our stories first. <laughs> and uh, we have an outro this week. Yes, we have one from Justin, a.k.a. Speed. All right. The most prolific outro composer. Thank you, Justin. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. <laughs> no, she's like, look, motherfucker, raise the shields. Bam, bam, bam. Bust a cap in that Frankie ass. That's it. Who's that guy?